Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, July 9, 2024 regular business meeting of the Olympia City Council. For the record, we have a quorum with all council members present this evening. Uh, so before we move on to the adoption of the agenda, I do just want to mention um, that we are obviously in very warm temperatures uh, these past few days, and I do just want to make the community aware that we do have a cooling center at the downtown uh, Olympia Timberland Library. Um, so it is in effect until tomorrow, uh, and the weather is expected to cool down afterwards. Um, and the homeless response team has been distributing uh, handheld fans and uh, water bottles to encampments and residents um, that we have connected with uh, during our homelessness outreach um, with the city. Uh, so with that, I need a motion to approve this evening's agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor of the agenda signify by saying aye. 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 We have an agenda. So the first item uh, this evening is item 2A, which is special recognition, a proclamation recognizing Muslim American Heritage Month um, to be read, a shared reading by the council, beginning with Council Member Cooper. Whereas the freedom of religion holds the distinction as a cherished right and a foundational value upon which the laws and ethics of the United States are based and Whereas Muslims around the world and in the United States specifically constitute a racially and culturally diverse group that is bound together by a shared belief in diversity as strength and unity and as power and Whereas Muslims make up more than 25% of the global population and Islam is the world's fastest growing religion and Whereas the Muslim American community provides and support and assistance to people throughout the community through charitable contributions, social activism, and community groups, and... Whereas, while Muslims make substantial contributions to nearly every aspect of society, including academia, law, business, healthcare, military service, and more, and... Whereas Olympia is home to a vibrant Muslim community that plays an essential role in enriching the unique character of our city and state, and, wait, there's more. <laughs> Whereas the Islamic Center of Olympia welcomes more than 40 ethnicities to worship in community together, which includes immigrants and refugees, and. Whereas we acknowledge that the history and contributions of Muslim Americans in our country are often neglected and defaced by prejudice, discrimination, xenophobia, and Islamophobia, and... Whereas, on this occasion, the city of Olympia recommits itself to standing against hate and injustice in all forms and to combating anti-Muslim rhetoric through awareness, education, community, and meaningful action, and... Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Olympia City Council does hereby proclaim July 2024 as Muslim American Heritage Month in the city of Olympia. And our community joins those of all faiths and backgrounds in the celebrating our Muslim friends neighbors, and the cultural and religious heritage of the Muslim community. Signed in the city of Olympia, Washington, this ninth day of July, 2024, Olympia City Council, Dante Payne, Mayor. You pop again. <laughs> yeah. And at this time, I'd like to invite up Dr. Amna Kazi, who is Olympia's Social Justice and Equity Commissioner, uh, for a few words. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I am actually um, very, very emotional and I'm at a loss of words as well because um, last year we accomplished this Muslim Heritage Month when uh, Mayor Dante Payne was a council member. And today the entire council and seeing my mayor sitting there and this is the second year and he has made it official that every year it's going to be the Muslim Heritage Month. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, Assalamu alaikum and hello to all. And once again, thank you, Mr. Mayor Dante Payne, an entire council of recognizing Muslim Heritage Month and making it official every year. 
There are almost 80 to 100,000 Muslim in Washington state. There are about 50 mosques around the state, and we have very own Islamic Center of Olympia in Olympia. Many of the Muslims are, Muslim Americans are professional doctors in working in healthcare system. In fact, a Muslim uh, doctor is the uh, health secretary of the Washington state who did a marvelous work during the time of the COVID with Governor Inslee. There are almost 1,000 Muslim employees who are working at Microsoft Budget Sound System. Uh, around the region, uh, Muslims have big uh, businesses, and they are working in large companies like Boeing, Amazon, and several others. This month, we honor the rich heritage, history, and hopes of the more than 3.5 million Muslim Americans across our country who have helped write the American story and move our nation ever forward, embodying the truth that diversity has been and always will be our country's greatest strength. As we come together this month to honor these contributions, we must also pause to reflect on the pain being felt by the war in Gaza. Too many innocent lives have been lost, and we pray for both our Muslim and Jewish brothers and sisters who have lost their lives, and pray for the left the people who are left behind in their families and living in <clears throat> difficult circumstances um, to help them out and this um, war to be ended. And I also would like to acknowledge and thank you once more to our mayor, Dante Payne. He's the very first one, City of Olympia is the very first one to recognize and pass the ceasefire resolution. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. I would like to acknowledge few guests who are here today. Uh, I hope we have uh, Mr. Imran Sadiqi, who is the president of the Washington State, and our speaker, uh, Mr. Javed, Sik Javed uh, Sikandar and Fahim Khan, who represent the American Muslim Advancement Council. We have uh, Rukaya Ben Sot from the Islamic Center of Olympia. I have all my Rotarians sitting at the back. Thank you so much for joining. I have my uncle and aunt and cousin who have traveled two hours from Seattle for this Muslim Heritage Month. Thank you so much, auntie and uncle. <clears throat> and all the community members who are sitting there, I would also like to acknowledge um, Congresswoman Strickland. We have representation. We have our, the director, Liz, here to support the Muslim Heritage Month. I would like to thank Senator Yasmin Trudeau, who's a great supporter of the Muslim community, who was our speaker last time, but right now she's at the trail. I would also like to thank Senator Claire. I think she was not able to make it as well. There are many other politicians who are strong support of our Muslim community. Thank you all uh, for supporting us, for this city council and our mayor for giving us the Muslim Heritage Month. Thank you very much, Mayor, and thank you very much, the council members. Our um, next speaker is Mr. Imran Sadiqi, the chairman and the president of the CARE Washington, the biggest association of Washington State. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for having us here today, and thank you, Dr. Amina, for uh, putting this initiative together. Thank you to the mayor and the city council for um, recognizing something that's extremely important during this time. Uh, in the work that I do, from nine to five, uh, we've endured a lot of struggles, I would say, this past nine months especially, with a very large rise in hate crimes, bullying in schools, uh, suppression of free speech. And little moments like this where you recognize the heritage and the contributions of the Muslim community is extremely important. It, this sends a message to the younger generation. I know that there's many younger folks that are, that are here and very supportive of this effort. Um, it sends a, a message to the younger generation that our efforts are appreciated, and that's going to just embrace the diversity that, that is shown by this great community here. Um, you know, Brother Mustafa, who's, you know, a central part of the community and the, and the Cham community that has started this mosque here as well. Um, this is a very, very unique community here in Olympia, and it's something that, that we should definitely appreciate. So I thank you all for, for recognizing that. And as always, if you all ever need anything from a civil rights perspective and uh, education perspective, then we're here to support as well. So thank you so much, and uh, congratulations to this entire community. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Imran Sadiqi. Our next speaker is uh, Rukhaya Vinsad. She's representing the Islamic Center of Olympia. 
Our uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Javed Sikandar, the American Muslim Advance, they are still stuck in the traffic. So apologies for that. Rukaya? Good evening. And I just want to say, Mayor, I think we have a connection. I don't know if you remember, we had class together. <laughs> Dr. J at the Evergreen State College. Check your bias at the door. That's where we were. So congratulations, and thank you for allowing us to be here today. First of all, City of Olympia, you're close and near to my heart. Um, I just wanted to share with you a little bit about me, a little bit of history. Um, my name is Rokaya Van Sot. Um, I was born during the Khmer Rouge Pol Pot genocide, and my family escaped the war and came here to the United States with nothing, just the clothes on their back and hope. And that is a story of survival, of courage, of bravery, of coming to a land where you have no clue what you're coming into and thriving in this society. My community, the Islamic Center of Olympia, which um, Brother Siddiqui said very well, that we're one that is very special. Um, in the 80s, most of us left our homeland to come to America, and the pioneers that established that property, they purchased 10 acres of land in Olympia and made that home. So Olympia is home for us. For 40 families, they dedicated two acres to a community center that we call today Masjid An-Nur. And if you, you're more than welcome to visit us there and learn about us. And I know um, Councilman Clark, you were there to visit us. Thank you for that. And what I wanted to say is that my story is one that I um, like to think that is of courage and contribution to the, the country, the fabric that we make today. And as we become older, we start to recognize and pinpoint things that are special, right? That makes us who we are today. And I just want to say for me, it being the Popo Khmer Rouge um, genocide survival, uh, my struggles and challenges teach me to be resilient and adaptable. And also that the victims of violence and war is very similar. Today in 2024, genocide continues and it sends an emotional survival trigger for me. And I'm heartbroken a lot of times. And this is because it's close to me and my experience. However, December 12th, 2024, 23, City of Olympia, you guys did something special. And that was the ceasefire resolution. So I want to recognize you for that, for calling an immediate and permanent ceasefire in the occupied Palestine, and to, to be bold and made a very courageous move, a, a small city like this, right, um, contributing to the nation to say that we can make a difference, and we want to see the change in the world, and we're here to stay, and we're here to make a change, and my community has come from nothing, and I'd like to say that we're contributing to the city now and our progress and the success of the city couldn't have been here without um, the people, my people. So thank you for that. Thank you for allowing us to be represented, to be here, to join you, and to feel like we belong. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. We have one more speaker, the President of the American Council, but I think he's still stuck in the traffic and he's not here. Um, if we can uh, just request the mayor, whenever he comes, if we can give him a one minute, it, I would appreciate We can go on with our agenda, however. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please uh, give him our regrets. We do have to move on with the remainder of the agenda. But before we do, um, there may be some words from council members. So. Any questions or comments from council? 
Council Member Partially followed by Council Member Gilman. Last year, it was a moment that had the hairs on my arms standing up and also feeling about time in the back of my head. This year, I'm proud that we're going to make it a tradition. And I'm proud that we're honoring our neighbors and our community members because diversity is beautiful. Thank you for being here today and for celebrating together with us. And I, I just especially want to appreciate, Rahaya said, belonging. And just mm -hmm. to let you know that from where we sit, you all belong in our community and you are of our community. And, yeah. Thank you all so very much. Uh, for being here, um, for being uh, partners to the city of Olympia, uh, for really stepping forward and being uh, outstanding community members. You know, the proclamation says that there are over 40 ethnicities that are represented at the Islamic Center of Olympia. Um, so when we talk about diversity, we mean diversity. And it really does matter um, that we have built this relationship uh, with all of your communities through the Islamic Center for Olympia. And I have to say, I, I very much want to thank um, Dr. Amnakazi for her leadership in that regard, for uh, really being a partner, not just to me, but to the city of Olympia. For you as a Muslim woman, for me as a Jewish man, this is a very heartbreaking time for many, many people in our communities. And we see the kind of rhetoric that insists that we be enemies. And we have come together to demonstrate and show our communities that we refuse to do that. <clears throat> and so I appreciate your leadership just as a resident of the city and now you're one of our social justice and equity commissioners, and I appreciate you stepping up to do that work. And I wanna thank all of you for being courageous enough to be yourselves, especially when you're part of a demographic that faces so much hate. And it's a brave, brave thing to do, to show up in a space as yourself and profess who you are to the world. And so, congratulations to all of you on another <laughs> recognized Muslim American Heritage Month. And one more thing on the ceasefire resolution. I was part of leading that process, but I do want to give credit where credit is due. And my colleagues, council members Cooper, Parshley, and Danny Madrone were certainly, certainly, certainly a, a big part of that work in getting that done. And so I just want to acknowledge their work and thank them for their contributions. And um, I look forward to uh, expanding our partnership and doing more great work together. So congratulations to you all. Thanks for being here. And at this time, I'd like to invite all of you who are in the room, who are here for, for this moment, to come up uh, for a photo with the, with the council here in front of the, the dais.
Okay, calling all council members back to the dais. <laughs> oh, is this brother from oh. <laughs> oh, has our final speaker arrived? Okay, you were stuck in traffic and you are here, so absolutely we will give you the floor. Thank you so much again, Mr. Mayor. Hello everyone. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is an awesome moment. Thank you for accommodating us. We drove from the east side. Uh, you uh, you probably have a good idea of the traffic on 405 and I5. So we're battling that after the work. Um, so thank you for uh, gathering here today to celebrate the Muslim Heritage Month. It is uh, it's it's an honor to address uh, and say a few words here on behalf of American Muslim Advancement Council. Uh, very quickly, the American Muslim Advancement Council um, uh, we we essentially work on driving Muslim participation and inclusion and consideration in American politics. That's really it's a it's a Washington State organization, um, and we work to educate the Washington Muslims about the political process. Uh, we want to activate the communities and to help them engage at the local, state, and federal political and policy-making processes. Um, I think this is a beautiful moment. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, a city like Olympia has recognized this month as the Heritage Month. Uh, we have worked with the city of Seattle and Eastside uh, in Redmond and Bellevue on different such um, opportunities, and uh, you know it's it's amazing how we do this. Um, at the same time, I think we all uh, people who believe in peace and justice, who believe in equality, who believe in inclusion, have long ways to go, especially when our tax dollars are being used to kill innocent people around the world. Um, every day I sleep looking at the numbers of number of people who, get, who are being killed in Gaza. Um, unfortunately, it's all become numbers, but if you look at the stories behind these numbers, they are very heart-wrenching. So um, I think gestures like this will add up, and someday we'll have peace in this world. And thank you, and may God bless you all, and may our efforts contribute to a world where all people can live without fear, where bridges replace barriers, and where the legacy of Muslim heritage inspires us towards a brighter tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your words. And I do just want to acknowledge again your long distance travel to be here for this very special moment. Uh, so thank you again for making it all the way and, and being here. Thank you for your words. OK, so that t concludes special recognition for this evening. And we will now move on to public comment. Uh, before we begin public comment, I do uh, just want to remind those who are signed up in person and also online, uh, there is a clock to my right, uh, your left. Uh, it will indicate that you have two minutes of time for your comments. Um, you have your green, yellow, and red stoplights on the box there at the podium. Uh, the green light indicating that your time has begun, the yellow light indicating that you have about 30 seconds remaining in your comments, and the red light indicates that your time has expired. If you do not finish your comments, feel free to email the remainder of your comments to the council. Um, and also before we begin, I do just want to remind the community that we are in an election season, so please refrain 
from uh, announcing your support or opposition to a candidate or ballot measure uh, in your comments this evening. And with that, I'll turn it over to the Mayor Pro Tem. All right, so we have quite a few in-person and online public commenters today, so I'll go ahead and call out a few names so that you can get ready to be in queue um, and come up and uh, share for a couple of minutes. So first, we have Glenn Harper, followed by Sarah Razor, followed by Matt Metzger. Thank you. I'm Glenn Harper. I work as uh, an end-of-life uh, doula. Um, I host a few death cafes in the area at senior centers, and I'm here to speak in favor of uh, the decriminalized nature movement uh, to, um, to allow uh, adults the use of naturally occurring plant entheogens. Uh, the word entheogen means to bring the divine within. Um, I am personally a uh, living um, example of the healing power uh, of these medicines. Uh, I moved here from Texas in 2017 in a dark despair because I felt like the world was going to end. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people probably felt that way due to the results of the election. And there's global warming and um, the Anthropocene extinction event. I was grieving for the death of the living world. This is how dark my despair was. And I didn't know what else to do except to try to to put a question to the universe, show me what can make life worth living. And I had two journeys using psilocybin mushrooms, magic mushrooms, and two insights that came to me was what the world needs more of is listening, and compassion is the secret sauce that makes life worthwhile. Those two insights allowed me to turn my life around I have work that is purpose supporting the aging and dying, and I'd like for um, the people that I support to have access to the healing that these medicines provide as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Racer. Thank you so much for allowing me the time to speak with you this evening. I'm coming to you from Key Peninsula, and I came this far because I need your help. You've always been a leader when it comes to the progressive nature of Washington State, and I'm asking for your support in the decriminalization of entheogens because you are that leader. I may not live in Olympia. I've spent a fair amount of time here and legislative hearings so that I can stay alive and so that the people I work with can stay alive. As a patient with chronically and terminally um, terminal diagnoses. I depend on both cannabis and psychedelics to keep me alive, to keep me functioning, and to be a contributing member of society. As a cannabis and psychedelic health and wellness coach, I depend on all of these plant medicines for my clients who are not being well served in any other industry, whether it be medical, mental health, or even the support of their communities. So I'll keep it short. I'm happy to answer any questions offline but I would just please beg you to consider this decriminalization, not just for Olympia's sake, but for all of Washington's sake. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next we have Matt Metzger, um, followed by Shuna Morelli, followed by Mila Gerson. Good evening, esteemed members of the City Council. My name is Matt Metzger. I'm a retired Marine Corps combat veteran. I served our country in the Iraq War in 2003 and survived an attempted murder by fellow Marines the same year. From 2005 to 2020, I was heavily medicated to function as a normal human being. These pharmaceutical drugs numbed me to the world, allowing me to simply survive and carry my trauma without truly living my life. I could not emotionally connect to my wife and sons, and many nights I prayed I wouldn't wake up and wish that an accident would end my pain. In 2020, just before retiring, I met a, tra a sailor with trauma similar to mine who found relief through psilocybin mushrooms. 
After retirement, I be began microdosing those mushrooms, and with the help of my VA doctor, I weaned off my medication in four months, and now I take a single capsule of medicine that I make myself. This medicine has changed my life profoundly, allowing me to connect with my family and truly live again. It laid a solid foundation for healing modalities such as therapy, which I still pursue. The transformative power of this natural medicine compels me to speak out and assist others on their path to wellness. I now help others as a micro macrodose coach focusing on harm reduction and safe, informed, responsible use. I also help others learn to cultivate and make their own medicine. We're not seeking to get high. We just want to feel okay in our bodies and safe around those we love. All humans deserve to live and not merely survive. To be clear here, I'm not a medical professional or a clinician, but as a peer, I've assisted hundreds of clients, your constituents, in their wellness journey with zero hysteria or hospital visits. Decriminalizing plant medicine will allow many more to find the relief and healing that I did. Let's give everyone the chance to fully live and connect deeply with those they love. Thank you. comment so that uh, the mayor pro tem can announce the next person's name and we can keep things moving along. Thank you. Go ahead, Shana. Oh, thank you. Good evening. I am an educator and I'm an author of both fiction and nonfiction and the founder of the Body Mind Bridge Institute. And I'm here to advocate for the de decriminalization of the natural plant medicines that help us heal from trauma, depression, PTSD, and so on. We've come a long way in our understanding of these natural compounds. There's a lot of ongoing research happening around this country, around Europe, a lot of places in the world. Here's a partial list of universities that are currently doing psychedelic research <clears throat> because they are so promising. One of them is in our backyard, UW. School of Medicine, Johns Hopkins, NYU, Stanford, Harvard, UC Davis, University of Michigan, University of Wisconsin, University of Texas, Alabama, then we go over to Tor Toronto, Saskatchewan, University of British Columbia, the list goes on and on. There are so many universities doing this research and finding out how we can use these compounds safely to help us heal. So the point being, these old policies regarding psilocybin MDMA, DMT, and others are outdated and they no longer serve us, these old policies. I personally know of a lot of mental health professionals and medical people who would like to be here, but they can't, they're afraid. They are afraid to even speak because they're afraid of losing their license. So they've asked me to simply say on their behalf that these natural compounds from natural plants have helped their clients, their patients, in ways that they were never trained to do. They were never trained to do it, what these plants are doing. So in summary, as lawmakers, uh, you know that some policies become outdated. And if such a policy is inhibiting personal freedoms and hindering access to our mental health, our physical symptoms, and so on, then I ask you to bring us up to date. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Mila Gearson, uh, followed by Shauna Montoya, followed by Kent Combs. Hi, I'm also here to speak in support of your efforts to de decriminalize plant medicines. I'm a licensed clinical social worker with decades of experiences of experience working in palliative and hospice care settings like others, and this is end of life care. Um, I also have experience working in addiction. I currently have a private practice and work with many clients who have used psychedelics to address mental and physical health issues. I have a PhD in palliative care and am an active participant in many global networks of practitioners and academic researchers focused on end of life issues. At the most basic level, decriminalizing psychedelics will enable health and mental health practitioners to help people cope with complex needs that are, that can, uh, that are not and cannot be addressed in conventional settings and methods. Destigmatizing plant psychedelics and plant medicines will benefit not only those suffering trauma and debilitating mental health issues, 
but also a wider populations with chronic serious illness and in death and dying work, which touches every sector and every social group in our community. It's a social justice issue. I applaud your willingness to lead on this and to move Olympia forward. Other communities are watching with interest. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, we have Shauna Montoya. Hello, good evening. I'm gonna to try to put this quickly into content. This is my son, Nathaniel Alexander Montoya. Alex uh, was a victim of a homicide last year on April 30th uh, by four minute, uh, homeless men in a RV that was parked in my neighborhood for over a year. Um, uh, they, um, a week previous to Alex's murder, somebody had knocked on the motor home and then a week later, someone knocked on their motor home at 2 a.m. and they decided to drive around and find anybody that they could. And they mur brutally mur murdered Alex. They beat him to death and stabbed him 10 times in front of my home. I heard the struggle. I ran outside. My son died in my arms. I just read that the city of Lacey has won a Supreme Court ruling on the parking situation for the city of Lacey to four hours, $35 fine, and immediate towing. Since my son's murder, and I gave you these papers previous because I'm trying to be as quick as possible, I live on East End Street, 20th and Elliott Street by Bury Park on the west side of Olympia. Our neighborhood has become the next Ensign Road. Now I want to reiterate that the murders of my son were moved from Ensign Road by the city of Olympia. I believe you guys spent over $700,000 trying to alleviate that plight that was up there. My son was the police at the time of my son's murder told me that they were investigating seven homicides within the homeless community. And Alex was the first citizen by the homeless. They were caught by the great work that the Olympia police uh, did to find them. But this is a parking services uh, photograph of that RV that had been up there for over a year. It should never have been allowed. Uh, they were by their own words, in court, chronic alcoholics and drug addicts that have lived in that motorhome since 2017. So I would like the City of Olympia to consider the same ordinances moving these vehicles away from my home. I've called parking services. I've called the Olympia police. The Olympia police tell me they could do nothing. I've called homeless services. Thank Finally, I, I did not get any response from them. Uh, for, for that until yesterday. I called for a year on Thank every you. single time. The, your your time answer. has expired, ma'am, but please stick this around. There'll be some response. There will be a response from the city in staff in a moment. Just stick around. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for I, I recognize that uh, everyone that comes uh, doesn't always public comment This is not just for the last one, but just in general And so we run through all of our public commenters and we ask that for folks that uh, might want to hear a response if there If there will be one to hold until the end and then that is the time where we might have staff respond if it's related Council has an opportunity to respond. It doesn't necessarily mean that we always do but um, that's how we sort of try to run it and, and try to be fair so um, so we hear you, um, and there will be a response. Um, so if you, if you could uh, stick with us, that would be appreciated. Um, so on to the next uh, would be uh, Kent Combs, and then following Kent Combs is uh, Destiny Rendon, and then uh, Veronica Disarum. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Kent Combs, and I'm here to advocate for the decriminalization of entheogens. Psilocybin cured me of my depression when nothing else worked. These plant medicines have been proven safe and effective in numerous studies. In our community, many doctors, nurses, and therapists believe in the efficacy of these medicines. However, they cannot utilize them to help their patients due to fear of losing their licensure. This is a grave injustice. In the year 2022, 1,243 Washingtonians committed suicide. 
These people are mothers, they're fathers, they're children, they're veterans, and they are my neighbor, our neighbors. We owe it to them and to their loved ones to explore every possible avenue for healing. I call upon you to pass this for them, for our community, and for a future where healing is not restricted by outdated laws. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Destiny Rendon. Good evening. My name is Destiny Rendon, and I'm a licensed mental health counselor working in downtown Olympia. I specialize in treating PTSD, eating disorders, depression, and anxiety. As a counselor, I've seen the mental health crisis rising and people continuing to struggle with even the best treatments that we have today. And over the last three years, I've been working on a PhD in psychedelic assisted therapies, learning from leading researchers in the academic field and abroad with indigenous communities from Amazon, Mexico, and West Africa that have been using these plant medicines for healing for centuries. The treatment outcomes that I've seen with people with PTSD and eating disorders from psychedelic medicines has been one of the most promising aspects of my entire career as a therapist. I've been trained in many of the best and latest evidence-based modalities like EMDR, CBT, DBT, and I've seen psychedelic medicines help people when none of the other treatments or multiple mental health medications did. And while I believe that eventually the laws will change and bureaucracy will catch up with what I have learned to be true in my studies of the safety and healing potential of psychedelic medicine and how they can treat a variety of mental health conditions with a very extremely low addiction potential, the failed war on drugs has made it extremely difficult as it hinders research, it stigmatizes traditional medicines used by indigenous peoples, and it criminalizes and punishes people with mental health conditions who are just trying to seek an alternative treatment for their suffering. And I've worked in my practice with many veterans, child abuse survivors, people with decades of inpatient and outpatient traditional eating disorder treatment, and they've had little to no success. And when none of these treatments worked for them, the psychedelic medicines gave them hope, healing, and relief from their suffering. And as the state capital, Olympia has the ability to inspire Washington and the rest of the nation by passing this initiative to show that we are forward thinking and progressive and tackling the mental health and substance use crisis that we're facing, starting with addressing these challenges at our local level, because we simply do not have the time to wait. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Veronica Desarum, followed by Anita Donaldson, followed by Carly Shoot, or sorry, Kaylee Shoot. Hello, I'm here in regards to the motorhome situation that the lady just talked about. I own an apartment complex, a 32 unit complex, uh, right on 20th Avenue and East End. The motorhome that people who killed her son were parked right beside my property on the south end of my property. Now I have nothing but a whole bunch of motorhomes on East End. All my tenants have um, sliding glass doors with a deck to that street. The, my tenants cannot go out. They cannot open their windows. They're constantly selling drugs. They're cooking drugs in there. At times you can really smell it. I have four units just in that stretch of buildings that I cannot rent because everybody comes and loves the unit. The first question is, do those motorhomes stay there permanently? My property taxes went up in one year from 34000 to 67000 How am I expected to pay a property tax bill with an increase like that and with all the rental rules? There is no accountability. We call the police. We call parking enforcement. Parking enforcement says that, oh, we just manage downtown. Now, I understand homelessness and I understand drug abuse because my husband has seven brothers. One was shot in the head because of a drug debt at 26. The other one, in December, froze on the street of Seattle um, from homelessness. And the other one had a massive heart attack from drug use. So I understand both sides of the coin, but some accountability is needed. So I hope you can do something about, you know, making, giving us some rights as well. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, all right, we have Anita Donaldson. Hi. I live at the Elk Runs, and I do a lot of the landscaping out there for fun. I enjoy being out there. But you can't go out there anymore. There's a bus there. His name's John. He cooks. You can see smoke come out of his car. They leave trash around, and I don't feel safe being out there working. I make that place look really nice. They leave their trash. You call parking authority. I have it. I have the app. I send them emails. I send them pictures. That's pictures of trash. They say, "Okay, your case is closed. We're sending it to your homeless." They know what they're doing. These trailers. They move it every 24 hours, and they move it down the street. So what rights can we put them maybe in a, a property somewhere that these people go without houses? Because got, we got kids that live there, you know, and it's just, I don't feel safe going out there. And it just, you could see like yesterday, we saw a drug deal. We're having people losing their stuff. They're stealing stuff from bicycles and stuff out of our properties. Car was broken into the other day. So where do we stop? Can we put barriers just for car sizes there? You know, like they have on Lowe's and Safeway, on Martin Way, they have little barriers just enough for cars. But there's a guy working on his dialer right there. Work it somewhere else. Work it at your house. I mean, it just, it looks really tacky. And even the lawn guy was there from the city, and he said oh, I can't get there because there's campers there. So he couldn't mow the lawn on the side of the roads. And he says, you be safe. So I work full time, and I just like being outdoors working, but not with them around. I mean, I have nothing against people, but it's just, and one's got a sign on his door, we'll move it tonight. Tonight comes, they don't move it. And this lady from the city went off on me saying she's by herself and she can't do everything. So... Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Kaylee Shute. Hello, my name is Kaylee Shute. My partner and I are now new homeowners here in Olympia, and we could not be happier. We are really grateful to have found a wonderful home in the city we love. Um, we are within the Burbank Elliott neighborhood, and we also really love our neighborhood park, Burry Park, that you've heard a lot about today. Um, when we bought our home, we were concerned about RVs. We read the city code, and we felt really reassured that the city code felt strong. It had, a, you know, RVs could not park in the same spot for t longer than 24 hours, couldn't park between the hours of 3 and 6 a.m., and if they moved within 24 hours, they couldn't move to another spot within city streets. We were excited to purchase our home with this code in mind, but unfortunately, within the last six months, um, we noticed a really strong uptick in RVs. What started at just one van parked every couple nights has turned into four or more RVs parked in front of the park. We now, we've called to report these RVs that clearly were violating city code as it was written and we're told that there's some um, city memo that says that if they move a thousand feet every day then it's okay. We weren't aware of this city memo and even see that that's not being enforced. We held a neighborhood meeting on Sunday, which we are really thankful to Clark Gilman for attending, and many of our neighbors also expressed the same frustrations you've already heard. Many are worried about the previous murder and an overdose that were both associated with RVs. Many are frustrated with the lack of response from the city um, and are frustrated with the trash and uh, everything that's been left at our park. Our neighborhood is asking for additional monitoring of Burry Park, such as the installation of lights, signs, um, or uh, cameras that could help deter criminal activity. We'd also like more clarity on the code as it's written. We've gotten many different answer answers from Olympia Police, Parking Enforcement, and Homeless Services, and we fully support adopting the code recently enacted by the City of Lacey. We're asking for your help, please. Thank you. Um, Thank yes, you. I would like to. Oh. Lee Reiner, you just knew that you were next. Yes. Okay, so, so uh, go I ahead. I'd like to add uh, another comment regarding these issues that have been here for the last four years. Uh, we had this problem two years uh, before this gentleman was murdered near our Bury Park area. That's near the Handy Pantry, it's near uh, Grub, 
It's on uh, near Division Street in Elliott, or some people, if you go out far enough, say 20th. This has been going on for four years. We've had a litany of neighbors keep calling the police, uh, talking to the non-emergency number, asking be, to be transferred to crisis response, asking to be transferred to any number of agencies to give us some relief over what has just been described. Um, there are no wa There is no water for these RVs. There is no sanitation. Therefore, there's defecation around these, and I feel f horribly for these people. They have no place to go. But at this point, we, we've reached a crutch, and I agree with the lady that spoke before. Um, we have become another Ensign Road. Ensign Road was the road to the hospital. It was full of RBVs, and I believe the city spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to remove that after what was in place. Um, my concern is the policies of the city of Olympia are very hazy. It seems like your staff really do not understand their own policies. If you ask them to explain each group, a crisis response or the police or uh, the parks give a different version. I do support Amy Stoll with the park. She's given us wonderful help and also the ranger, Henry from the parks, trying to come and help us with these issues but we definitely need more help before we have another murder. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so next for in-person comment, we have uh, Rakai Vansot, I believe it is, and then uh, Yasis Osman. Uh, we'll call, f oh. oh, okay. <laughs> Just in case you are actually here, we have Rakai Vontov and Yesos Osman. Sounds like you're not here. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna go ahead and move to in-person, or sorry, uh, virtual public comment. Um, for folks that are waiting for responses, it is a shorter list. Uh, so we have uh, Elizabeth Klein. Elizabeth is traveling. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. Thank you so much for listening to us today. My name is Elizabeth Klein, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker, combat veteran, and advocate for the safe a personal use and decriminalization of antigens. I specialize in mental health and trauma recovery, working primarily with active duty military, veterans, and first responders. I also volunteer with many veteran organizations, including the Pierce County Veteran Treatment Court. My own healing journey with PTSD Deeply impacted by the combination of therapy and the personal use of psychedelics drives my commitment to advocate for their decriminalization. Um, I could speak more on the efficacy and the mental health and substance use uh, benefits at a later time if requested. Um, as you know, cities across the nation have decriminalized entheogens for personal use. Olympia now has the opportunity to join this progressive movement and address the multifaceted benefits of decriminalization for our community. Many residents seek relief from mental and physical ailments when traditional health care falls short, yet the majority fear repercussions, which deters individuals leading to unnecessary suffering. Decriminalization or decriminalizing these substances can provide compassionate relief, allowing for exploration of alternative healing and spiritual growth without fear of arrest. Decriminalization respects the right to bodily autonomy. Individuals should be free to make informed choices about what they put into their bodies for personal relief and spiritual exploration. Antheogens have been used for centuries by various cultures for spiritual purposes. Olympia can collaborate with indigenous groups to respect these traditions and prevent cultural appropriation, ensuring ethical use and preserving cultural integrity. Um, marginalized communities uh, face significant barriers to health care. Decriminalization antigens can reduce these barriers by providing natural avenues for healing that are more accessible. Uh, 
Was that my time? Yes. Yes, it yes, was. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, next, we have Colby Burns. Colby's traveling. Tell Mr. Burns, you're muted. I fixed it. Okay. One more time. My name is Colby Burns. I'm a clinical pharmacist. I'm a veteran of the United States Navy. And I'm here to talk about the decriminalizing and theogens proposal for the city of Olympia. I'm fortunate to be one of the last people to go today. So we've heard a lot about the commentary of why this measure should advance forward. You know, the status quo is that. 130,000 veterans have lost their lives due to PTSD um, since the wars began in Iraq and Afghanistan, more than have died in combat. It isn't just about our veterans and our first responders. We have an opioid crisis on the streets with over 100,000 deaths every year of opioid abuse, fentanyl abuse. There is limited access to treatment and not very effective treatments to help these people with drug abuse. We're providing potentially another option for this population by agents that are very different from opioids, even though they're often lumped in with opioids, the pharmacologic profile, the safety profile is so different that there's almost no real known lethal dose of LSD or psilocybin. Yet these agents have been marked as a schedule one drug, no legitimate medical use, while agents like fentanyl are technically a legal substance that can be prescribed. And there's a place for those in hospitals, but on the streets is where we're seeing they're very dangerous. So this measure to me is not just about helping veterans and first responders and those populations that have been heavily um, political influence. It's also about helping people that are the, the less, um, less politically influenced groups um, in our society. And change is hard, you know? Going against 50 years of prohibition is gonna take some courage. And we've seen that there's a lot of inertia to continue the status quo. But I just ask you to think about what the status quo entails, and are we willing to continue to tolerate that amount of death and suffering in our population, or can we move forward into a new era? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Cody uh, Zaluski. Hmm. Cody's traveling. <laughs> oh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> All right. Hello, my name is Cody Zaluski. I'm at the Psychedelic Medicine Alliance of Washington. Firstly, thank you for your service on behalf of the City of Olympia. I'm urging the City Council to pass a resolution concerning natural psychedelics presented during the prior City Council meeting. I've helped write several state-level legislation pieces on this topic and served as a member of the HCA state-funded psilocybin worker mentioned by the Mayor during the last meeting. I've emailed you all the results of our findings since the work group concluded this year. During the work group, staffed by MDs, therapists, BIPOC leaders, etc., decriminalization had the most unanimous consensus among all of the issues we tackled. Regarding decriminalization of these compounds, we have enough research. There are literally thousands of studies on psychedelic medicines. My background is in clinical research, specifically in relation to neuroimaging and pharmacology. We understand both the risks and many of the benefits of these compounds. The sky hasn't fallen in dozens of other communities who have passed similar resolutions. The question posed is ultimately a straightforward one. If someone is stopped on the streets of Olympia in possession of psilocybin mushrooms, should the city invest resources into prosecuting them, yes or no? If foregoing prosecution sounds unobjectionable, please pass this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Karen Wright. Karen is traveling. Excuse me, I have to read my statement if that's all right. Uh, sure, Maybe? Karen. Um, I'll just ask, it looks like you're a little bit away from the camera, so I'll just ask that uh, if you just uh, speak up. Oh, you just moved closer. That would be helpful. Yeah. I just want to make sure we can hear you. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mayor Payne and council members. Thank you for the opportunity to tell you why I fully support and encourage you to, the dec to decriminalize 
the use of antigens. I have a personal success story I like to share with you that I recently shared with the Tequila City Council where I live. I have, during the 1990s, I worked for the city of Tequila, first to develop their human services program, and then, I'm sorry, first to develop the human services program where my integration of human services and law enforcement prompted the police chief to invite me to join the police department. During the 1990s, I worked, I'm sorry, the only reason my employment ended was because I had developed a number of serious, mysterious medical conditions and my medical leave could not be extended. Because of my loss of identity and purpose and an increasing number of mystery and traditional treatment resistant illnesses, I fell into a deep depression that lasted over 20 years. Because of my, most of the medications I was, am I out of time? You're doing great, Karen. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, fast forward. In, in early 2000, my friend John, whom I hadn't talked to in years, called me, excited to tell me about the ethnogen and psychedelic renaissance, something I had not heard of. He is deeply involved in this space from his home base in the San Francisco Bay Area and will also be speaking tonight. What he told me, the research and studies that showed very promising results for the treatment and promising possibility of curing of many medical conditions, including depression, anxiety, chronic pain, PTSD, addiction, and more. I was fascinated and wanted to know more, so I set out on a journey to read. You can go ahead. I want to show you a bag. Sure. These are the medications. There's 25 in this bag that I took prior to my production. This so, is what I Karen. Out. Uh, unfortunately, your time has come to an end. Uh, for what it's worth, you can. Uh, this decision is not happening tonight, so you can send it uh, the rest of your comments and email to us. And thank you for showing us the bag. Thank you. Okay. So, all right. So uh, we're moving on. Uh, mic. Mic it on. says it's on. Yeah, the light's on. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, next we have Karen Allen. Karen is traveling. Hi, City Council. As a healthcare practitioner with 30 years of private practice, I've had a front row seat to the physical, mental, and emotional pain, misery, and trauma of the everyday person. For some, there's a clear diagnosis and a ready answer, a pill, a surgery, counseling, nutrition, physical therapy, something. For others, often after years of complex illness with no clear diagnosis, often having tried everything that's been offered, the unsolved pain leads to a growing desperation, to depression, to disability, to thoughts of suicide. I've read the promising research and successful case studies using entheogens for healing, especially in trauma and deep desperation and complex illness. Some of the people I work with have hopeless patterns of illness and pain that would be a great match, but I can't offer them that option because entheogens are illegal here in Olympia. Those who are healthy enough and have the money may travel to gain access to psilocybin, to ayahuasca, peyote, other sacred plants. I see them when they come back with their psyche and their substance intact, with their pain managed or relieved, with their immune systems back online. It's not a panacea, but it's an important option, bringing courage and hope and healing. City Council, you are going to make many important decisions this month, this year, that affect thousands, tens of thousands of people in our community. But maybe no other vote you'll take this year offers so much relief of personal suffering at so little cost. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have John Phelps. John is traveling. Okay. 
All right, it looks like your audio is connecting. When you're ready, you can go ahead and begin. Oh, John, we can't hear you. No, we can't hear you now. We'll give you just a moment. Um, if you're not able to resolve the issue, what we'll do is uh, move on to the next couple of commenters. There's just uh, three more after you, and then we'll, if you can hang on, uh, we'll come back to you and see if you can resolve your mic issues. Can't Ms. hear you. Mr. Phelps, we can't hear you. Um, Kelly, could you try uh, putting that in chat, what I, what I just said to them, and then we'll go ahead and just move on. And hopefully we can get at them afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, so next we have Casey uh, Eckerhelm. Casey is not signed up, but Larry is... Okay, uh, so uh, Larry Norris. Larry, Larry's traveling. Everyone can hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great. So thank you to the Olympia City Council for introducing and referring this very important resolution that's been spoken to quite a few times tonight to decriminalize natural entheogenic plants and fungi. Uh, my name is Dr. Larry Norris. I'm the co-founder of the Decriminalized Nature Movement, which emerged from Oakland over five years ago and is helping to steward the successful passage of similar, similar policy in cities across the U.S. Uh, since June of 2019, 28 cities and counties have passed this policy nationwide, almost all receiving unanimous decisions. Washington, D.C. passed with 76% voter approval, Detroit, Michigan with a 61% approval. And there are currently about 50 active decriminalized nature teams across the nation and globally. Over the five and a half years since Oakland decriminalized and in the subsequent 28 cities and counties across the U.S. that have passed, we have not seen any significant increases in reports of emergencies or crime related to antigens in any of these locations. In fact, decriminalization has worked as a risk reduction strategy, and more people are able to find the education, resources, and support they need. Those who are new to entheogens will be able to educate themselves within community on safe and responsible practices. And as more and more scientific research and media talk about the benefits of entheogens, people will naturally want to see what this is all about. We need an approach that honors the self-agency and sovereignty of adults and the unalienable right to have our own relationship with nature. When we talk about public and personal safety, it is important to note relative risk. Some drugs with the highest risk uh, for public safety are already legal, including alcohol, tobacco, and pharmaceuticals. There are no laws against eating as many poisonous mushrooms as one wants. Even taking selfies have a higher rate of injury and death than all the entities <laughs> combined in this resolution. There's no reason to spend the city precious resources going after people looking for alternative approaches to healing. Olympia can be a leader in this movement as one of the first 30 cities nationwide and fourth in Washington to stand on the right side of history and begin repairing our relationship with nature. I would happily make myself available for any questions you have on these topics. Thank you to the city council, staff, and decriminalized nature Olympia team for all of your incredible efforts. Thank you. Um, next, we have Ashley Carl. <laughs> Ashley's traveling. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council members. I am here tonight representing Watchdogs Olympic Region Multimodal Planning Office, uh, who has been working with city staff on the Capitol Mall Triangle Sub Area Plan, which is on tonight's agenda for your approval uh, as item 16. Watchdog previously requested a slight revision to the language in the ordinance uh, via an email from our planning manager on June 10th, 2024, that was involved in bringing the very meeting with our staff and city staff. Um, we'd appreciate the following slight revision uh, in the final paragraph that proposed for the addition in the sub area plan chapter seven. And that is uh, to address comments from Washtenaw about potential impact of new development to US 101, the city will strike consider creating and replace that with create a two tiered trip cap in the planned action ordinance 
The first tier would be lower than the one described in the EIS. Insert and will be tied to reaching specific milestones in delivering the best Olympia access project. Uh, your staff have this uh, in writing from our planning manager, Dr. Mazur, and uh, we haven't received a response, so we are commenting tonight. So we can get that language inserted. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, we'll circle back. Uh, that's the last of our list, so we'll circle back to John Phelps. See if they're still on and their mic's able to work. John is declining to speak. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, all right. And then uh, just for the record, uh, with that last public commenter, Ashley Carl, um, uh, did sign up as uh, representing uh, Washington State Department of Transportation. All right. With that, um, I'll take it back to the mayor. Thank you very much, Mayor Pro Tem, and uh, thank you, everyone, for your comments uh, this evening. Um, I do uh, want to call forward uh, Darian Lightfoot, who is our Director of Housing and Homelessness Response, uh, in response to uh, the concerns regarding RV parking. Darian. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Darian Lightfoot. I'm the Director of Housing and Homeless Response, and just want to speak um, a little bit to the liveaboard or RV context to help um, just inform residents and to share with council what we're trying to do in regards to liveaboards in our community. So when Ensign Road was a large encampment, um, the city tracked about 120 to 150 RVs or people living within their cars throughout the city. When we took efforts to close Ensign Road, we felt that we really needed to reevaluate how we are addressing RVs in the community. And the current ordinance is written more with a lens around RV storage along the roads. And it's saying that you can't store your RV um, along the city right of way. But it becomes a little bit more complex when someone's living inside and it is their home. It's challenging to tow when someone's living inside and so we needed to adapt a policy that better reflect us being able to support people living in their RV and the impacts on the residents and roads, especially around congregation of RVs. Um, and so how we set up the current policy that was referenced is that homeless response, parking services, OPD, and legal got together and developed a policy that I would allow us to engage with people living in the residence, acknowledge the impact on the neighbors, and to stay within legal standing. And what that currently looks like is that every RV needs to move every 24 hours. And in that, that they need to move at least 1,000 feet and RVs cannot be within 500 feet of one another, hoping to prevent congregation um, of RVs. And, and we're, we're really aware of the current area. We've been out there last week, and we were there this week. We engaged with two residents. One is a family that has a six-day-old child, and we're really trying to get into Family Support Center for permanent housing. And so we're really familiar with the residents. Right now, we have tracked about 10 to 15 RVs within the city, and so we're seeing some progress. But this is having people move. It is saying, ha saying settled here in this area, you cannot stay and so finding another place within the city is something that we find allowable um, because there is no place for people to set up and park if you are living in your vehicle. We understand that maybe we're not there right at the 24-hour mark, but with our collaboration of homeless response going first, engaging with folks, having an assessment so someone can get on coordinated entry, it allows us to find them housing. If we're unable to find them housing or they're not willing to engage in services, that's when it goes to parking services. And it's a three-ticket situation. If that still doesn't work, then it goes to OPD, and that engages the next level of engagement. So we have that internal policy really to address people living in their cars because the, the tow situation of someone living inside just isn't effective um, when it is someone's home. 
And so that's the, that's the policy that we're working under to really mitigate trash impact on neighborhoods in the congregation of many RVs, which could lead to another large encampment like we saw in Anson Road. And so I'm happy to answer any questions on how we're trying to address RVs or what we're seeing in the identified area. I have a few, but um, council members, any questions or comments for Darian? Mayor Pro Tem Wynn, followed by Council Member Gilman. Yeah, uh, Darian, thanks for talking about uh, the the process to get where we are now, and I hope that uh, at least gives a little bit more context for folks um, that came in about this issue. So uh, I'm wondering, well, I want to acknowledge this is hard work. Um, it is not a ideal situation even to get where we are right now. Um, so. What is, uh, what is our role currently at the city? Um, and maybe that's on your team, uh, maybe that's partly on OPD or, or other teams in the city. Um, but as far as like checking in and, uh, and keeping residents uh, aware of like move situations when they're happening, if, if there's any um, communication with the residents, uh, being responsive to when there's issues, that sort of thing. Um, with residents living in their vehicles? Excuse me. Uh, with the folks in the neighborhood. Folks housed in the neighborhood. Is there People that are not in RVs. Okay. <laughs> um, so the communication is goes through our Q alert system. So when someone submits a Q alert, that is really the best way to keep us informed. Each RV is connected with a license plate or other sort of identifiable markers, and we're able to keep them in our system. So we are grateful for pictures or timestamps because that does keep it within our system. So when someone submits a Q alert, they automatically get a response. And so it stays with homeless response and then it goes to parking and then OPD. In terms of informing the larger community of the RV policy, that's something that when we're engaged with, we're able to share. Our current sure. policy is on our homeless response page. Um, so that's the, our, our ability to communicate with residents that are curious about our RV policy is if they engage with us or if they access our, our current website. I heard a count. I heard a council member say, what is a Q alert? <laughs> can, you, can you tell us what a Q alert is and how someone would, I'm tired of this thing tonight. <laughs> um, how some, like what, what would cause someone to, what, what is the most appropriate use for a Q alert? And yeah. What is not? A Q alert is just really anything to inform the city about something we need to address. A pothole, a code violation, um, a noise ordinance. It's anything that's not necessarily to call law enforcement, but it's to inform the city that there is some sort of code violation that needs to be addressed. So um, it's a large system that can be navigated through like our central services and connected to the correct department for us to follow our systems and address whatever issue a resident is bringing to our attention. So we get a lot Lot of Q alerts for homeless response around trash, around RVs, around encampments, um, and that's what stays in our system, and that's what we get familiar with cases too. And so, if we've had an interaction, that would be helpful um, in terms of like distributing knowledge to another department. That's all within our Q alert system, so it makes things more efficient, um, more communication attached to a case. Um, so, really want to support our Q alert system because it's been really effective. Okay. Um, I, I know other folks have questions for you, so I just uh, one last one is uh, uh, your team is, is unique in that uh, you probably hear, other than the Olympia Police Department, you probably hear the most from uh, people, uh, the ones that are stably housed, um, that, uh, that are feeling, whether it's psychologically or, or physical, physically unsafe, and so what, what support or resources, even if it's not within your team, but is there for folks? What is this, the protocol? Um, can you share anything about that? We have found success, and I understand this can be more challenging, but mm -hmm. we do have some neighborhoods and some RV situation where it has kind of been wrapped into a piece of the neighborhood, how it has seemed like, yeah, here's a good area for you to park. We'll bring out water, you know, uh, more of an exchange of goods, how people have introduced themselves to folks who are living in their residence to say, 
hey, you know, you have a lot of debris. Can you please clean it up? Or we're having neighbors over. Can you please move? Because these parking spots have been helpful. So we've seen success when people have engaged with one another. With outside of resources of that, I don't really have um, much to give. But we've seen a lot of tension decrease when we understand people's stories and what's going on. Or simply like, your RV is making me scared. Like, I'm nervous with you parking here. And then building some sort of relationship or connection that way. But we've seen some success through that. But outside of that, I don't have any specific resources to point people. Thank you. Yeah. Mayor, can I ask for a point of order really quick? Sure. Because I just don't think that Q alert is the public facing complaint. And so if I'm right, maybe someone can tell me, but I believe it's actually the online code enforcement complaint system that the residents in the neighborhoods would go through. Is that correct? Right. We call it it's the Q alert is what we call it. But yes, off our website, there is a place where you can enter a concern or complaint. That's the system that Darian is referring to. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Councilmember Cooper. Councilmember Gilman. I, I appreciate your coming to ex explain these things. I'm, I'm wondering first about, did you say it was 500 feet in this? So what, is that a block, a half a block? What, 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 is, what does 500 feet look like? Our frame of reference is you don't want to see another RV. So we don't expect everyone to have a tape measure, but it's like, you don't, we don't want you to be able to see another RV. If you can see it, it's too close. Mm -hmm. And so that's about a half of a block, about a full block is what we'd say. So we want another RV to not be in the line of sight. So then what, what is the process if there are four along one block in front of a park? Yes, then we go and we say they're all out of, they're all not in compliance. And so we'll share that they need to move. If they're not moved within the next 24 hours, then we come back. If they're not moved, then that's when they go to parking enforcement. So we really try to lean our homeless response on our relationships, on getting people inside, mm -hmm. on finding ways for to really close the issue and not move people around the city. As we said, we've had around 150 people living in their vehicles and we've been able to reduce that to about a dozen and I know there's hot spots some neighborhoods will be in, impacted pretty intensely and we're able to engage and then other neighborhoods and it really shifts around the city but we have seen great success and that's because we know where people are they come up on the coordinated entry list we say oh we know so and so is on evergreen let's go get them they're in parking and so when we have this set up and we've built relationships we know where people go we're able to get them into housing and really reduce people living in their vehicles i appreciate that durian and could you just speak, um, a couple of people asked about a safe parking program. Is that something we've considered? What does that mean? Safe parking programs have popped up a little bit throughout the West Coast. They're really, really challenging to navigate and they end up having more barriers than success. It's, you need to have an on-site mechanic. There's a lot of fluids that goes into RV. Does it need to be drivable? Can people leave and come as they go? They, they end up being kind of dangerous. Even in traditional RV homes, the RV technically has, can only be about 15 years old before it has to be re-upped. So we've done some research and really looking at other safe parking um, opportunities throughout the West Coast if they haven't been super successful. And so what we found we stood up Quint Street Village. We've added more tiny home villages. We said living in your vehicle is not sustainable. It's not healthy. It grows a lot, a lot of mold. It, it's not a safe place for you to be exited in the case of an emergency. So we found ways that are more safe. We get people out of their vehicles into a way that we feel is more safe, habitable, and, and more stable. Thank you. I appreciate that explanation. <laughs> Any additional questions or comments? Uh, Council Member Cooper. I feel need to add to that and back up Darian a little bit because not all of us were here when we um, passed the emergency declaration and told the city manager what to do. And when we did that, create an RV parking, safe RV parking space was one of the three things that we called out in a directive. And we had at that point hired our first homeless coordinator and really 
from that point through now, I bet this community has tried three or four different times to pull something off like that, even with a specific site, willing partners, money, uh, resources to, to build and manage, and it just is not, like to Darren's point, it's not the most compassionate way to take care of people and, and give them a path to success, and this one is. And I know that that doesn't bring back your son. It won't be appropriate right now, but she'll be happy to talk to you after the meeting, and I'll, I'll do that for the mayor since I have the floor, and he'll give me a nod if it's okay. Um, and just that it, it's a really hard situation, and I think that my view of what we just heard is our process is too long. And so could we bring the current staff policy to the city council so we can look at how to improve the municipal code and see if we can give our staff any more tools to shorten that process because if one RV shows up and the process starts and another one shows up, you're just elongating and we know that you, it, it's not just towing, it's trespassing someone from their home and it takes a lot more to do that and it, there is no right answer and I'm looking at a map as you're talking I thought I had been to every city park. I was missing one, apparently. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'll be there tonight, if not tomorrow. But the, you know, there's there's woods and it's dark and it's off the main drag. And so, how can we make sure that we can bring other elements of crime prevention and through environmental design to that space? And I'll just say, add one other comment. I, I was so encouraged when we went and met with the. Um, American Legion and mm -hmm. OPD had already been there, arrested a couple of drug dealers in cars, and I think of a similar, this, I mean, yeah. I know it's not exactly the same, but I hope that just the neighborhood highlighting this for us this way will help us find some other opportunities for action. Council Member Parsley. I know there's no words that I can say to you. There's none. Just know that I, heart you, I empathize with you. I know also that I've been on the journey with Councilmember Cooper um, and Councilmember Gilman from the beginning and we built a plan. Actually, I take the back, the community built a plan for us and we passed it. It's the one community plan. The pandemic interrupted us enacting all three sections and this plan was meant to balance between the compassion for those that find themselves without shelter and without means with the safety of our community and the safety of the people that are unsheltered because it's equal for them. And I have seen our staff look at that balance and work very hard. And like Councilmember Cooper, that's not gonna bring your son back, but I am very proud of our staff and I'm proud of all the actions we've done to go from 150 RVs down to a dozen. I know they're in your neighborhood, some of them, and I, I will work on that. Councilmember Cooper's right. When we get pointed out a hot area, we do go look. But I, I just have to say the staff has been working their heart out, and it, and it is a, a, even to a point of compassion fatigue and burnout, trying to do this balance act that our community gave us and, and called the One Community Plan. Mm -hmm. Thank you, anyone else? Um, thank you, Darian, for that explanation. It's very thorough and gives us an understanding of just what it is that we're dealing with here, uh, which is very, very complicated. Um, so back to uh, the safe parking uh, initiative, I guess you could call it, that you were speaking of. I'm assuming you're talking about a designated area where, okay. <laughs> That was one of my questions. Yeah. Um, okay, so the city of Lacey's ordinance uh, from 2019 is four hours, and my understanding is that that ordinance is allowed to stand per the state's constitution uh, as decided by our state Supreme Court. Um, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So I am very uh, interested in exploring more in this and understanding this and why um, you know, sort of why we, we have set the parameters that we have. Obviously, we're trying to balance accountability and compassion. Um, 
but certainly I want to acknowledge the people who are here in the room this evening. Uh, certainly one of our new residents who is experiencing uh, dealing with, uh, you know, seeing some of the, these things that are frankly not the best parts of, of what it means to live in our community. And I would appreciate if we could do more to enforce uh, our ordinance as it stands. Um, I want to be clear that um, obviously the, the state Supreme Court does not, ref or excuse me, the U.S. Supreme Court does not reflect the values of the city of Olympia. We know we just saw uh, a decision come down that is frankly allows uh, local governments to criminalize homelessness. We are not going to do that. We are not headed in that direction. Um, we will continue to uh, take an approach that uh, takes um, uh, the uh, compassionate route and gives consideration to those who have the least among us in our, in our society, in our community, um, and we will continue to do just that. However, um, there is certainly a, a balance here, and I want to acknowledge those who are in the room and, and just speak to the fact that we can try our best to do more, revisit our current ordinance as is written, and, um, and possibly look at what our neighbor is doing, um, why is it, uh, you know, permitted to, to uh, you know, sort of persist? Um, they're right next door, and, and yet we, we seem to have such a different approach here. And, and I wonder if this is something the Regional Housing Council has ever discussed. Um, but certainly I do feel that these types of things need sort of a, more of a regional approach, as we'll see uh, local governments start to change uh, their response to homelessness. Um, so uh, with that, I, I do understand that um, what you're hearing tonight, Ms. Montoya, is not going to bring your son back. I, I am acknowledging that you are holding a photo of him up right now. Uh, and I'm looking at him as well. Um, and it's not easy to come in here in a room full of people and, and express your concerns um, after what you've experienced. Um, so I hear you. We will do our very best um, to respond to your concerns. I uh, agree with Councilmember Cooper. This is very similar to what we experienced with uh, VFW 318. Um, and we certainly want to do what we can, again, to balance that accountability with compassion. Um, and what you're asking us tonight is to just boost that accountability up a little bit more. And certainly you're not the first group of community members to do that uh, this year. Uh, I have no idea there were going to be others talking about the beautiful issue before sure. the Sure. Mm. I have no idea. Sure. Um, for those who could not hear her, she said that uh, she didn't know that she would not be the only one uh, here this evening to speak to this issue. And so um, I do believe that you had a question. Um, and Council Member Cooper did uh, do the right thing by saying that typically this is not a two-way dialogue. However, the Mayor Pro Tem reminded me that this is a very human moment and you lost your son. So if you have another question, would you please uh, approach the podium and, and ask your question? Thank you, Dante. When homeless services come across, I understand the layers of homelessness and the drug problem that we're having. I do understand this. <clears throat> when they come across people that they obviously have very mental health issues, violent tendencies, drug tendencies, danger, that they could be a danger to the community, why, what do they do to warn the community of that risk or that potential danger that is there? Um, that I know that the vehicle that had to do with my son was approached by the Olympia Police Department on a couple of different occasions, seeing that they were there. I don't know for domestic violence. Uh, by their own omission in court, they were all drug addicted and all alcohol addicted and had been on numerous occasions contacted by homeless services and parking services. They felt harassed and at the end, at my son's death, 
is what propagated them to get out and murder him. And it wasn't even him that knocked, knocked on their RV. He was blocks away from where it happened. So they just, to their own admission, got in their RV and searched for someone out at that time of night and murdered Alex in front of my home, which I would have never, ever expected. I've lived there for 30 years. My taxes have gone up exponentially in the last few years living there. It was safe. He was raised there. He played there. All my children were raised there. My neighbors are terrified now that there's been a murder to even go around it. And I couldn't believe that it just kept adding and adding and adding, even knowing. It's almost like the thing in the paper was like, here, come over here. It's a perfect spot. There's a convenience store. It's private. It's wooded. Our neighbor is a very mature neighborhood. But I would like uh, uh, the community to be safe and warned if they do know that there's mentally ill people. There's the man in the, the brown bus, completely mentally ill, screaming in there by himself. Every uh, city every the, the, the drug problem that's up there is it, you see the traffic going up there to purchase drugs. You, sure. you see it, you know. And so I'd like to be informed as a neighborhood that if there is someone dangerous in there that they have had contact or the police have had contact with, put a warning on the end of the neighborhood watch thing saying, you know, sure. there are dangerous people suffering from mental illness or severe drug abuse. Thank you, there. Mrs. Montoya. Thank you. So it sounds like you're asking a question about how do we notify neighbors uh, that there is potentially something unsafe happening in, in the neighborhood or in the community. Um, and that sounds like a safety question. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm curious about that myself, your question, and I see that our police chief is in the back, uh, Rich Allen. Um, so certainly um, we, we want to make sure that if there is information uh, that folks can uh, reach out and contact um, the police department if they have concerns uh, or if there is a, a place to go for more information. Chief. Everyone's definition of what is unsafe and what is makes them uneasy is a little bit different. So it's really difficult for us to go to a situation and we, we'd almost be asked to diagnose somebody and kind of triage them on the spot and then um, you know, tell everyone in that area um, what's going on with that person. That doesn't seem right to me. Um, if a person is truly dangerous to themselves or others and they don't want our help, and sometimes we can force them to get that help and we can remove them from the situation. That's the best way to do it. Um, but certainly if there's someone in the neighborhood, if there's someone in your area that you feel unsafe about, give us a call um, and we can fill you in on the situation or what's going on the, the best we can. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I just wanted to add a bit to that, too. Um, when we're able to transfer folks into tiny home villages or permanent supportive housing, we have clinicians and behavioral specialists on site who are prepared and equipped and knowledgeable for that. And so that's, again, us really leaning on our relationships and connection with people to say in a neighborhood where people feel unsafe and the supports aren't there is not the best place. We don't want people living there. And so us doing the homeless response approach first, again, has really gained success to get people at a temporary housing um, site that does have those resources and skills and um, because that's where we want people connected to. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mayor Pro Tem Nguyen. Oh, um, Council Member Madrone, did you have something that was related to this? Because I was... No, I wanted to speak to some of the other uh, comments oh, okay. that we heard tonight. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, for, for what it's worth, I think we all listened. Yeah. 
Um, I am very frequently proud. You probably might not like to hear this, but I'm very frequently proud of all of the efforts that city staff are doing, some Herculean efforts, uh, doing some things like, especially like on the ground that I would not personally sign up to do, <laughs> um, that I think are the right things that is uh, just really, really, really tough work. Um, um, you know, working with people uh, sometimes at, at their worst part, right, of their life. Um, and uh, so while I am very proud, I also know that we haven't reached utopia yet, right? We're not necessarily where we want to be, but that's uh, not to say it hasn't been without any efforts and a lot of great work by smart people. Um, and also, um, I find myself challenged uh, because uh, I know that there's there's harm not just of, of the most vulnerable person in this situation, but there's there's harm done to, uh, not every time, um, but a lot of times to everyone that's around that person, right? Maybe in direct relationship to, or living nearby, or maybe uh, you, know, you wanna go on a walk one day and you don't feel safe. Um, I have the privilege of, of sitting up here and getting to take part in some of these uh, really major decisions, and I love, this city, and I do not always feel safe at any time of day to go and do whatever I want. And I don't want to do that great of things. I just want to go outside for a walk. And, and I think a lot about where I'm going. Why am I walking? What's the route? Um, I think some of that also has to do with my demographics, um, uh, just like being a young female. Um, but uh, yeah, I, uh, I think a lot about that you know, how we say that we're balancing compassion and accountability. And um, I'd, also, I'd also like to see more of a balance there myself. So I really appreciate everyone coming out. I know some, some folks have already left. Um, uh, I uh, want to just transition. I, I want to just make sure that I address uh, some of other folks' uh, concerns, um, or uh, rather things that they're for, uh, that they came out for. So um, one of uh, the biggest ones uh, was uh, all of the um, folks that are uh, uh, sort of quote unquote pro-decriminalized nature. That's how I've noted it all down here um, for folks. So. Uh, I will say that um, I'm not the first person to get excited about this one. Um, and that's just honest. Uh, I don't know if you all watched our last council meeting a couple of weeks ago, um, but uh, I know that I have a lot to learn here. Um, I know that I have my own biases. I think just probably just being socialized. Um, uh, with uh, things that I uh, know to be good and things that I know to be bad uh, growing up. Um, I also know that I don't know everything and what I can commit to is that uh, I will do my homework on this one as much as I can. I will not become an expert by the time we make this decision, um, surely. Uh, and I do also, uh, I uh, respect people that are, that are professionals in this, um, even though uh, I want to know more information about it. I noted a couple of folks that said that they were open for uh, just like further discussion, and I know that there has been uh, some email traffic about that, so I'm, or about this uh, uh, psilocybin topic, and so um, I'll do my best to, to go through all of that. Um, so um, I can say thank you for coming out. Uh, thank you for joining virtually. Um, I'm not uh, at this moment completely sold on this. There's there's a lot to uh, to look into, um, and uh, um, so so I will remind myself to be open. Um, uh, and then I also uh, there's a. There was a question or a comment from um, uh, someone from uh, the Washington uh, State Department of Transportation. So I was wondering if we could have a comment from staff on that, mm -hmm. about the language change that they were requesting. Yeah, we're actually going to cover that in the Capitol Mall Triangle mm -hmm. sub-area discussion that's coming before you later this evening. Yep. We, can, okay. we can discuss that. OK. Um, all right. Thank you. 
vote that one down too. Thank you. Council Member Madrone. Yeah, I want to thank uh, everybody who came out and spoke on the various topics this evening. Um, uh, and in particular, the advocates for decriminalizing entheogens. Um, you know, you've been emailing us for over a year requesting some action uh, around this. Um, and I'll admit, as I saw emails coming, and I was like, is this, is this really a big deal? I don't even hear about people getting arrested for this, you know? So um, at, at first, I, I just kind of put it aside. But, um, you know, I randomly decided to, to engage with you all uh, through email, and I could just feel the passion uh, come through and how important this was for you and um, having you all come in here and tell us the reasons why this matters to you uh, just really uh, really lands it home for me. I'm really glad to uh, stand with Council Member Gilman and Vanderpool um, uh, on the referral that we put forward um, and just for a couple of um, updates in uh, my conversation with the city manager I know that um, part of our referral was asking the police chief to just look into you know what has enforcement looked like on this so he's going to be looking through this the past five years and just let us know you know what does that landscape look like in Olympia um, and then uh, our, 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 our hope is that in sometime in August we can bring this forward uh, to the council as a, as a business item so that uh, we can hopefully invite a couple of, uh, of advocates to speak for maybe a little bit longer than two minutes and help provide some of the education um, to, to folks who, who do, who do want to hear a little bit more. So um, I just wanted to give that update and then I know also that you all have been available to meet with folks uh, who uh, feel like they do need more information. So um, I know that that offers out there as well. That's all. Thank you, Council Member Madrone. Any other comments? Um, I also just wanted to weigh in on this. Um, just to give you a sense of, of kind of where I'm at. Uh, and uh, Mayor Pro Tem spoke to this a, a little bit. Um, although I don't think I need to be um, sold on some of the, the, the benefits and aspects of this that I personally am familiar with, um, my concerns are mostly around uh, making sure that the city is not, um, that we're treading carefully rather um, in, in this decision to do this, that we are not endorsing open recreational use and open public use of these substances. And, and that's something that we uh, take very seriously. And personally, I this comes on the heels of what we call the Blake fix of, for the state. And, and frankly, I, I support those efforts. Um, and so I want to make sure that um, we're not conflating uh, these issues uh, and, and confusing the public. Uh, and that, that's mostly my concern, but certainly the health benefits, the spiritual aspects of it, the history to uh, indigenous communities and so on is, is obviously something that speaks to me. Uh, and so I will certainly be, um, you know, uh, continuing to, to work with my colleagues um, as, they, as they work on this resolution and and give it some more thought and consideration um, and then make a decision. So thank you for being here tonight. All right, so uh, that concludes public comment for this evening. Um, and it looks like we are going on for almost two hours at this point. So uh, before we move on to adoption of the consent calendar, I know it's going to be late, uh, but I would like to call for a brief five minute recess uh, so that we can uh, continue on with our business in a moment. It is now 7.50. One motion, three actions. <laughs>
Okay, so uh, we will move on to adoption of the consent calendar, but before we do, I am tracking that we have uh, one poll requested, which is item uh, 4C, the approval of a bid award uh, for the 6th Avenue Sewer Extension Project. Um, and my understanding is that this poll was requested by Council Member Vanderpool. Oh. <laughs> um, good evening, Mayor Payne and council members. Uh, my name is Ton Jeffers, and I am the Deputy Director of Public Works. With me is Eric Mahew, and Eric is a Senior Engineer for the 6th Avenue Sewer Extension Project. And we're here tonight to um, answer any question that you have regarding this project. Yeah, it's a very brief question. Thank you for staying around. Um, uh, yeah, so in in the report, it says that it came out, of, you know, this may just be procedural, but it came out 11% over the estimate. Now, I'm, I'm very curious because of us thinking of our finances in the next year and where we are, does, is this a common thing where it ends up being a certain 10, 11% over? Is this a, um, uh, so how, how, how often does this end up happening to us where the lowest bid is higher than what we expected it to be? I, I would say it's not common. Um, typically I shoot to be in the middle of, of the bids. Uh, I haven't been low in quite a while, but it's, it's a tricky, uh, challenging time to estimate just because of the supply chain. Uh, rising pre prevailing wages and rising cost of uh, material so it, it's probably it's not normal um, but you, you do want to shoot to be in the middle thank you and that's a good point you know as where we are with the cost of labor and the cost of supply I, I'm very curious about um, where we think about that financially going forward if we have to make adjustments I, I appreciate you coming out and talking a little bit on that and but um, I will make note in future meetings about whether or not we should consider any of those adjustments going forward in the next few years. City Manager Murray. I'll certainly let my public works team uh, add to this answer, but I think the staff do try to take all those things into account. I think as Alex is saying, it's a, it's a bit of a tricky time right now to, to estimate with kind of material costs, but they are trying to look at those material costs and, and wages and, and make our best effort. It is rare that our bids come in over our engineer's estimate because we try to be fairly conservative um, with our engineer's estimates in particular to make sure that we can work within the project budget that's allowed. So I think they, the staff do a really good job of that, but from time to time, we even us get surprised when bids come in the way they do. There's risk out there for contractors. The bid climate is what it is sometimes, and it's not as competitive as other times, and there's a, a number of reasons why sometimes we, we don't hit the mark on our engineer's estimate. So I don't know if you want, guys want to add to that, but I, that's, I would just add that to this conversation. Yeah, just real quick uh, to add, uh, the timing of it probably added to the cost, you know, bidding this late in the summer. Contractors probably have their schedule already set for the year. Um, typically, I'd like to go out in January with a project like this, but here we are. So, so that did add to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you both very much uh, for staying so late into the evening uh, to answer that question. Um, but it's an important one because I'm sure our community members would probably be looking at the staff report and wondering why. So we appreciate you explaining and, and spending your time with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. You're Thank you both. All right. So we'll move on to adoption of the consent calendar. Um, I need a motion in a second. So moved. Second. All those in favor of the consent calendar signify by saying aye. 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 Consent calendar is adopted. So that takes us to our other business If this evening. Uh, I do uh, just want to remind uh, council and also inform the community that council did receive, uh, we did receive two study sessions on two of the items that are on the agenda this evening. Uh, and those items are the approval of the community oversight of law enforcement recommendations and the approval of the ordinance adopting the Capitol Mall Triangle Subarea Plan. Uh, so we will begin with item 6A, which is the approval of the Community Oversight of Law Enforcement Recommendations. Uh, and here to present this evening is Stacy Ray, our Interim Assistant City Manager. Stacey. Hi, good evening. So for the record, I'm Stacy Ray, Interim Assistant City Manager. 
I also served as the project manager for the community oversight of law enforcement process. So for tonight's presentation, I'm joined by one community member who participated um, uh, on our community work group and two social justice and equity commissioners who will each have an opportunity to share their perspective tonight on the recommendations and the process on behalf of both the work group and the commission. So I'll just want to say welcome to Olivia Hickerson, who I'll um, have up in a moment, Mark Hodgson and Robin Rosen Evans. We were going to have Chrissy uh, with us tonight as well, but unfortunately she had a last minute conflict come up and was unable to make it. But before I do move into the uh, brief and even briefer now presentation, I just want to acknowledge that we have other social justice and equity commissioners here with us tonight. So um, we have some on Zoom. So we have um, Karen Arnold, Marianne Osmond Wells, Larry Watkinson, and we have others that are in person tonight that really stuck it out um, to be able to uh, be present for this conversation and for comments and action from all of you tonight. So also just want to welcome um, Parfait um, Basale, Genevieve Conseco Chan. Um, we'll hear from Mark in a few minutes, uh, Rochelle Martin, um, Fazia Muhammad Ali, um, and we'll hear from Robin Rosen Evans shortly as well. I also want to acknowledge two members that are no longer on the commission but had been involved in the work, so Jessica Ray Nunez and Wesley Nguyen. So with that, um, as you mentioned, Mayor, Mm -hmm. uh, the Social Justice and Equity Commission has shared their draft recommendations and received feedback from the Community Livability and Public Safety Committee on May 22nd. Um, representatives from the commission, here we go, um, shared and discussed the recommendations with the full council at a study session on June 11th. So tonight the action for your consideration is formal approval of the recommendations on community involvement and uh, oversight and policing. My role tonight is to provide a brief overview um, just to help bring folks along that maybe haven't been involved or following the process to date, um, how we got to this point and share uh, brief highlights from the recommendations, but really it's for the opportunity for you to hear from our participants. Um, and then, um, after that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mayor, in which case you'll have the option to take formal action to approve the recommendations tonight. Um, let's see. I also want to acknowledge before I move forward that we had 11 exceptional community members who took part in developing the recommendations. So um, we have uh, J.D. Barton, Devon Brim, Chrissy, uh, Carol, Jay Stetton, Candace Hanna, Shauna Hawk, Olivia, who's with us tonight, Alejandra Hunt, Robin Martin, and Tiffany Walker. So a huge thank you to all of them as well for their role. Um, and then I, before I get started, I also just want to again acknowledge the Olympia Police Department. So um, the leadership of Chief Allen, Deputy Chief Costello, and Deputy Chief Parker. We had great representation and participation from the department throughout the process from all levels without the department, and their input was invaluable to where we are today. So when we embarked in this process on May of 2023, we did so with the following direction from you all um, and purpose focused on ensuring accessibility, objectivity, transparency, accountability, and education. The process that we use that you all are familiar with at this point um, was really highly collaborative. Um, it was a co-design process in which everyone who was participating had a role in developing the final recommendations. So we worked with three primary groups, social justice and equity commissioners, a community work group, and members from the Olympia Police Department. The groups worked independently and they worked collaboratively throughout the process. We also had opportunities for community members to provide comment, either through public meetings, but also through a community survey. And so now we're at the very last phase of this process, very last point. So shown here, um, again, as a reminder, the purpose of the recommendations is purpose statements included in the recommendations, and also, re also a summary of the enhancements. Um, the purpose laid out here is to build trust and legit legitimacy in the city of Olympia's public safety system by enhancing and maintaining the community's role to ensure accountability and transparency. Woven throughout the recommendations are expanding the involvement of community members, attracting a great diversity of representation, expanding the scope of the auditor, 
enhancing that transparency and accessibility in the reporting of data and findings, supporting community in helping educate community members and helping them better understand the system, and ensuring that the overall system is very responsive and is working towards resolution in a timely manner. So um, at the recommendation of Councilmember Cooper, we've updated our graphic. So this is no longer the current system. And I know there's a lot here, and I don't expect you to read every bullet at this time. But um, what I will say is I'll just highlight some of the changes. But what's shown graphically here is the proposed system. So what will remain the same or continue to have elements of the state and regional um, agencies in, engaged in oversight. Um, OPD will continue to have their internal Office of Professional Standards and lead internal use of force review boards around critical incidences. The City Council, you all will continue to um, recruit and hire a police, uh, civilian police auditor, um, although the auditor's scope is expanded to include more involvement in receiving complaints directly, proactively commenting on planned OPD updates to policy and training. Um, communicating out the, the auditor, communicating out their findings and recommendations with the community, um, and meeting regularly with the new community board. What's also shown here is the establishment, or the existence, I suppose, of that new community board. So that would be a seven-member board. Um, what's really new about the makeup or the, the role of the board is that they'll regularly meet with the auditor to better understand the auditor's findings and provide community perspective on the recommendations. Board members will also have a role in engaging with the community and providing education to the community. So this graphic is a slightly different way to think about the recommendations. Um, I think one of the most important things to highlight about the recommendations is that we're talking about a proposed system that has several important but independent parts that, um, that are make, it, make it up, that it's made up of. Uh, the police department, the civilian police auditor, and the community board piece. So for the system to be effective, all the parts need to maintain their independence. So within the system, the auditor is directly um, um, accountable to you as the council, and also the community board is independent in that they're advisory to you. But what's critical is that there's collaboration and relationship among the independent parts. They rely on each other for information, they rely on each other for input, um, and they'll need to work together for the overall system to be the most effective it can be. So if you do choose to move forward with approving the recommendations tonight, staff has developed a model to support that implementation. Um, this includes the expanded scope and contract for a civilian police auditor to include the additional responsibilities shown here. It also includes a proposed program specialist and staff liaison housed in the city manager's office that would be funded through the recently passed Thurston County Public Safety Tax. Um, that staff, staff person will be responsible primarily for areas of you know, helping ensure that collaboration amongst the independent parts and also supporting community education outreach and the, the work of the community board. So, after um, taking action tonight comes the work of implementation, which is being led by Assistant City Manager Debbie Sullivan. That would include code updates, you know, recruitment and hiring, and further development and work around the procedures and processes that would make the system come to life. Um, in the interim, while these steps are underway, Debbie will continue to work with our current auditor in their current role, and the Social Justice and Equ Equity Commission can continue to serve as the body that receive and, um, updates from the auditor and provide input on the mid-year and the annual report. Okay, so let's go ahead. I want to invite up our guest speakers who are the participants in this process to share a bit about their uh, experience and highlights from the recommendation. So, Olivia. Yeah. I appreciate that. Hi, my name is Olivia Hickerson, and as a community member in this co-design process, it provided us with a vital platform to engage candidly and constructively with the inner workings of law enforcement in Olympia. Through well-facilitated discussions, we gained deep insights and the capacity to address complex questions about police operations, significantly enhancing our collective understanding. Our facilitators excelled at addressing our concerns, tackling each unresolved question, and ensuring timely feedback. 
The recommendations we developed are pivotal steps toward me meaningful change, particularly with the expansion of the police auditor's role. I'm personally eager to observe how this expanded role is implemented and how communication responsibilities are managed within the Olympia Police Department. I'm grateful for this insightful and rewarding experience, which has broadened my understanding of our police department and provided perspectives on how other regions address similar challenges. This process highlighted the urgent need for enhanced public education and greater transparency, both of which are vital as we navigate the complexities of the digital era that are not accessible to everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight and contribute to this transformative process. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. So next I would invite Mark Hodgson, uh, Chair of our Social Justice and Equity Commission. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, City Staff, and Members of the Public. The Social Justice and Equity Commission is here today with a law enforcement recommendation that reimagines community oversight and policing and creates a culture of transparency, trust, and partnership. We started from the ground up with input from the community, stakeholders, field experts, and staff. Our final recommendation captures the spirit of partnership, the spirit of servant leadership, and the spirit of Olympia. Staff and fellow commissioners have spoken about what our recommendation does. I'm going to speak briefly about why we're doing it. After all, Olympia isn't associated with high profile incidents of police misconduct. In fact, our city is often a leader in fair, equitable, and compassionate law enforcement practices. But by bringing forward this recommendation today, we are showing our commitment to reach every person in our city who has experienced discrimination, distrusted law enforcement, or was skeptical of the investigation process. By adopting this recommendation, we are recognizing the concerns of the public and declaring our commitment to transparency, accountability, and oversight. I'm proud to say the Olympia Police Department was a dedicated partner in this process. They listened, asked questions, sought common ground, and were willing to do what it took to make this recommendation a success. It is our hope that this recommendation serves as a blueprint for other cities across our state and across our nation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And lastly, um, I'd like to invite up Robin Rosen Evans, um, our new vice chair of the Social Justice and Equity Commission. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to address you here tonight. I'm asking you to approve the Social Justice and Equity Commission's recommendation for community oversight of law enforcement. When we began working on our recommendation, we were asked one thing. What values did we want reflected in the recommendation that we were going to ultimately give you? And while there were a number of values that were suggested and were incorporated into our final recommendation, the two core values that are the foundation of the recommendation that we are giving you here, or we have submitted, are the, are the values of transparency and accountability. These values form the foundation of the recommendation that Stacy has um, briefly discussed in which you have um, read on a number, of, a number of different variations and a final recommendation. This recommendation provides flexibility if over time and after sufficient evaluation changes are determined to be necessary because the, the process is ongoing and there will be um, points during a calendar year where the, where we'll see whether or not it's working and what needs tweaking, in other words. And there is also sufficient, um, there is a sufficiency, there is sufficient specificity so that everyone knows what is expected of them. 
there are really, there's no room for guesstimate or fudging. Everyone knows what is expected of them, and there will be a mechanism to track whether or not what has been put in place is actually working. With enhanced accountability and transparency comes trust between, trust building between the community and law enforcement. And I think it's also so important that this is not being done in response to a community tragedy. It is being done because you all recognize that it is always best to get ahead of an issue and to work to prevent a tragedy. And that is what the adoption or the, um, I have to get the right word, the approval of this recommendation would do. Um, before I conclude, because it's been a long evening and I, I don't think you need to hear from me too much longer, I'd like to thank a couple of people or groups. First, I'd like to thank the community co-designers whose input and concern, even though we worked separately, um, we were able to um, hear and we input their concerns into our recommendation. I'd also like to thank Stacy Ray for her really great patience and guidance. She guided us through this process from the beginning. Uh, Debbie Sullivan for her deep institutional knowledge and patience. Mm -hmm. Catherine Olson, who's not here tonight, for both her legal expertise and in bringing her experience in police reform. And the, or the uh, Olympia Police Department for being full and willing partners in this process. Without their cooperation, this could not have been done. In my previous life, for 35 years, I had a adversarial role with police many times. And I've dealt with many, many law enforcement agencies uh, in the past. I have to say that Olympia Police Department is just a unicorn. They are really, I have just been so impressed with their, with their sincerity in this process. Um, and that's from somebody who was a, a public defender for 35 years. So I have seen good policing and I've seen very bad policing. And I have seen very, very few police departments, if any, uh, that are like the Olympia Police Department. And I, I really want to give them <laughs> kudos. And uh, I just would like to close with a quote because I think that really this quote brings together what we're all here about. Uh, Margaret Mead said this. Uh, she said, "Small, a sm there never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that has. So every long journey begins with one step. And what we're doing here is the step. And I hope that other cities around the country join us in, this, in our travels because I think this will save lives and it makes us better. Thank you. So I'd like to just, um, before we move to turn it back over to you, Mayor, I'd like to just again acknowledge Olivia and Mark and Robin for speaking on behalf of the groups um, this evening, just say thank you to them. And I'd also like to ask for other commissioners that are here, if you wouldn't mind just standing up so we could acknowledge and recognize you as well. For a minute, just a minute, please, I know it's late. Okay. That is what they Oh, yeah. That's so nice. Okay. Um, so that's it for the presentation piece. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Stacey. Um, all right. So it looks like we've got a few questions or comments. So we'll begin with Council Member Parsley. My question, my questions, oh. Our mics just aren't working well. Um, first, a, a comment and then a question. 
Um, Stacy Ray and Assistant City Manager Debbie Sullivan, you guys rock. Um, from the moment I first worked with you and you did the public um, driven budget process in my first year mm -hmm. to helping us bring together the one community plan, reimagining public safety, and then this. Mm -hmm. It's the demonstration of participatory democracy where our community tells us what they need and what the pl best plan is for our community. And you guys drove the ship. And I just want to call that out because you make me very proud. My two simple questions, and I forgot to ask them. They're, they're actually fairly simple, and it's just so I don't make an assumption. Um, the RFP, I'm assuming the definition of what you're looking for in the RFP is driven by what this plan came forward with. And then is it going to come straight to council um, or CLIPS uh, when, before you send it out, or is it already on process? Uh, do you want to? respond to that? Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to answer that question. So we're going to be working with Katherine Olson to develop the request for qualifications or request for proposal based on both the recommendation and the implementation considerations that um, Robin spoke to as well. So we will put that together. My, in, I envision working this through community livability. So that that's what question? I would have recommended. Okay. Um, my other one is, and this is an assumption, because we are doing stipends for all of our advisory committees, is this community work group also going to get stipends? Yeah, we've included in the recommendation that they receive stipends. Thank you. Council Member Gilman. Thank you. I, I appreciate and wanted to underscore um, Ms. Rosenevin's comment that it's, it's not because we're seeing awful things but in the name of transparency and accountability and because things could change in the future, we want to have structures and institutions like this um, so that we can be a less biased, anti-racist town. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud of this work and I'm, I'm proud of what our police department is doing now. And I'm also inspired by the suggestion we heard tonight for an OPD mascot. So. Um, I don't know how we're going to work the unicorn into the new vehicles. Oh. But. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, that's so happening. Uh -huh. Council Member Vanderpool. Yeah, I'm going to have a short because we have a long night. But I, uh, I'm, you know, I'm very confident that this is the right choice for Olympia. You know, we are, there's a lot of knowledge, experience, lived experiences, community involvement built into this. I mean, and the one thing that I appreciate the most is that it's ongoing, that this is an ongoing process, that, that we will continue to make adjustments and needs as, as they come, uh, occur, which is something I think that all good policy has baked into it. Um, and uh, yeah, and so it's going to be easy vote for me. Also second on the unicorn on the new police vehicles. So <laughs> We could put a flak jacket on it. The color scheme is going to be awesome. Thanks. Any other additional questions or comments? Councilmember Madro. Thank you for all the work that went into this. I, I spoke when we had the study session and I felt I said what I needed to say then, but I, I just wanted to add on to this whole unicorn thing. I think that the chief and the deputy chief should be identified by, you know, <laughs> having an actual, you know, horn Lights on the forehead just so we know who they are. <laughs> A light car. All right. Anyone else? <laughs> So this is a really full circle moment for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that with sincerity because I made the decision to run for council after the murder of George Floyd. And so to be in this seat tonight and be able to cast my vote um, to approve these recommendations is really, really moving mm -hmm. and I'm, so humbled by everyone's work in this room. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your tenacity, your persistence, your patience, and for caring. Um, as you know, Councilmember Council Member Gilman just said a moment ago, this is about 
the heart of the mission of the Social Justice and Equity Commission to become more and more of an anti-racist community. That was your purpose for your creation. And tonight, we take one more step towards doing that. And so thank you, all of you. Thank you to the Olympia Police Department for your cooperation. I think that you clearly um, understand that there's something of value and it makes you it makes it easier to do your job when you also care about transparency and accountability because your jobs are to serve our community, not be suspicious of us, right? And I think you understand that. And so I'm just really, really appreciative of your leadership and your work. And Debbie, you were gone on sabbatical and you were given all the praises <laughs> while you were gone. <laughs> so I'll just say and reiterate again, thank you for your intuition to pivot at the right moment when we needed to, to keep this moving because it was so important to us. And we appreciate that leadership and using that gut instinct to do that. Thank you. And there's many, many more people in the room that I would love to thank individually, but for the sake of time, I won't. But just know that I really appreciate you and thank you so much. And so with, with that, um, I'd love to entertain a motion from the Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah. Um, I know that it's been probably for most people a really hot day, um, and then <laughs> followed by a long night. Um, and we have, uh, it's true, we've heard uh, different iterations of this presentation as it's uh, kind of formed to the final one that we see before us. Um, and I hope that we don't uh, even for a minute take for granted how very, very, very important this is tonight. Um, so much so, I hope there is some sort of group photo outside later with all of you. I think that would be very appropriate. I saw, uh, Fozzie, I don't know who this person is to you, so I don't want to assume. Although, uh, they, <laughs> um, uh, they were uh, running to take a photo with you. I was like, that is exactly the right energy. This is a huge moment. It's a huge moment. And so many different hands, so many different perspectives had to come together. For, for it to happen. Um, there was, I don't necessarily want to speak at, uh, against, uh, though there was this, um, this notion that, uh, you know, this is uh, us as a city collectively coming together to get ahead of, of uh, things before bad things happen. And, and um, you know, I won't dwell, but um, there have been some unfortunate things that have happened. Um, to do with public safety in our community. And uh, there's some part of, part of it where um, that's, you know, you're never going to really eliminate everything. But there has been some very key incidents um, that have gotten a lot of public attention, a lot of public scrutiny um, that have uh, not, uh, not helped as far as building suspicion, I think, on both sides, on all sides of things. And had we had had this in place and implemented, I wonder if a lot of that could have been mitigated. I wonder if um, uh, if policies would be different, right? If, uh, uh, if um, protocol would look differently, um, or if there would be more trust and more relationship building um, between community and law enforcement and our police auditor and all of those involved now. Um, to have more confidence in the process when an after action or review, review is taking place. So, um, so, but now going forward, we'll have that and what a powerful thing that is. So um, I won't go on. Um, uh, I'm very excited and privileged uh, to make the motion tonight. Um, so, uh, I will move to approve the community oversight of law enforcement recommendations. Second. All those in favor of approving the recommendations for the community oversight of law enforcement recommendations signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations.
Bill's in a unicorn cake, right? <laughs> Thank you all so much again. All right. So that takes us to our next item of business. <laughs> No pressure. Which is item 6B. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. No pressure, Joyce. <laughs> um, item 6B, which is approval of an ordinance harmonizing the Olympia Municipal Code with the missing middle housing ordinance. And here to present this evening is Joyce Phillips, our principal planner with community planning and development. Joyce. Hi, thank you. Good evening. Um, this evening I wanted to bring forward a, an ordinance to help harmonize our community's uh, middle, missing middle housing ordinance with our current code. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're in this unique situation and how we can help um, consolidate our code so we have a clear set of goals and policies and regulations moving forward, um, at least until we address this next round of state changes to the Growth Management Act. So the, in the intention of this presentation is to clarify what the harmonization process actually means, why we're in this position, and how we pro propose moving forward. So just a high-level overview of a, of a somewhat lengthy process is that um, we're in this unique position because the city adopted the Missing Middle Housing Ordinance in 2018. Um, it was challenged and invalidated by the Western Washington Growth Management Hearings Board in 2019, and that ruling was then appealed by the city to the courts, and that took us through 2019 through 2023, and ultimately the Hearings Board's ruling was reversed, and ultimately the ordinance was upheld as valid by the Court of Appeals Division II in June of 2023. The challenge to the middle housing ordinance took a number of twists and turns along the way before the decision of Thurston County Superior Court Judge Indu Thomas was issued, reversing the Western Washington Growth Management Hearings Board, um, and then that was uh, upheld on appeal by Division Two. But it took until November of 2023 before the Western Washington Growth Management Hearings Board issues an, issued an order on remand from the Division II Court of Appeals, dismissing the action and closing the case. And so what that means is that the missing middle housing ordinance was reinstated or came back into effect in November of 2023. But in the six years <laughs> that had, had ensued, we had made some revisions to the Olympia Municipal Code, some of which were the very same sections that the missing middle housing ordinance had um, revised as well. And so now what that means is we have two ordinances or two municipal code versions that are both in effect. And sometimes the changes are fairly minor, but sometimes they're a little bit more substantive and it makes it a little challenging for our staff to t talk with people in the public about what's allowed and what the requirements are. And so when, this, when you have this type of situation, you essentially go through a process to harmonize your ordinances and um, essentially we had to work with the legal department because we weren't sure what this was, the process was about. But essentially, it offers the city council the opportunity to pick and choose um, between the existing languages where they, where they are different and say this or that. It's not an opportunity to write something new. You kind of have to pick between the two. Um, but it's a, it's a way to consolidate and harmonize the ordinances. And please do remember that all of these proposed code revisions have already gone through public hearing processes and public processes and even council review and consideration in the past. So um, that's why this is a somewhat abbreviated um, process for this harmonization at this point. To help us develop the ordinance, we went through um, conversations with our legal department and our permitting staff. We developed this harmonization report where we identified where the discrepancies in the code exist, what the difference is between the two sets of language, and with a recommendation of which um, language to use. And um, that helped us develop the ordinance that you have before you this evening. It does not attempt to make changes to the language that were outside of the previous decisions. 
Um, there will be some related work around middle housing to address other state requirements that are newer than, than what this addresses. That will happen through a separate public process that's just kicking off this month. In making the recommendations for the ordinance under consideration this evening, staff looked at um, additional work that had been done, um, like for example, some of the um, considerations were made around permit processing or parking or other uses in some of the low density residential zones. We chose the one that, we most often chose the ones that offered the most flexibility um, in the standards, and then also that would be least likely to require revision next year when we bring back the um, code revisions to address the new changes in state law. I want to take just a, a minute to give you three examples from the long list of the harmonization report, um, just so you have a little bit of a taste of what we were looking at. Um, and then, so I have three examples in this slide and the next two slides to just show you what were considered in the harmonization process. So this particular example talks about minimum lot size. Um, I just pulled out a couple of our most, uh, our most common zoning districts, the R4 to 8, residential 4 to 8 units per acre, and R6 to 12, um, which is 6 to 12 units per acre, and what the minimum lot size is in square feet. And um, you can see the one that we're recommending is the one, the language that's in our current code. An example for the minimum lot width, um, you can see that it's the same in either example. So it doesn't really matter which one we highlighted there, we're just using the existing code language. And then in the third example, we looked at um, parking, and that was something that um, we had since addressed. We spent a lot of time talking about parking and writing up code provisions around parking in the missing middle housing ordinance. We also went through a subsequent housing action plan and residential parking analysis that occurred, I believe, just last year. And so um, for the residential parking standards, we are proposing to use the current code language um, because it was specifically um, developed in response to our housing action plan as one of the recommendations there. Um, it's also a little bit easier to apply, um, and so it simplifies the code language in that way as well. It's also better aligned with some of the language around parking that's in the new missing middle um, housing sections of the Growth Management Act, so it's least likely to require revision to our code in the future. Just as a reminder, I do want to um, specify that under our current code, any proposed development with five units or more is required to provide at least one accessible parking space. That was something that was really important to our community, and that provision would remain. So in the interest of time this evening, I'm very happy to discuss any of the provisions that are included in the draft ordinance or the harmonization report um, or answer any questions you may have, but I wanted to provide this draft recommendation motion uh, on this slide, and I'm going to come back to it in a second. But if you have any other questions, the um, city has a specific email address for middle housing. It's middle at ci.olympia.wa.us, and we also have olympiawa.gov forward slash missing middle. And so that's where people can go to find more information, not only about the harmonization um, work that we're doing, but about the phase two work that's kicking off this month as well. So happy to answer any questions and provide a little hint <laughs> so of what we're looking for this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joyce. Also another business item that's been a long time coming. It's good to be here. Uh, Council member Gilman. Well, I'm all in favor of harmony, okay. just in, in general. <laughs> but, and I appreciate the work that was put into this. Could you just briefly describe the phase two? You mentioned it, but could you just describe what else needs to be sort of reconciled to adopt our code? Um, sure. So in the next phase of work, there will be three new bills that passed in 2023 and four that we'll be looking to implement. One is House Bill 1110. It's called the Middle Housing Bill. Um, they've all been codified in RCW or are in the process of being codified, so I can't roll off the RCWs like I used to. Mm -hmm. 625 maybe, <laughs> 3670, 625. So there's that one. There's also a, um, a bill that's specific to accessory dwelling units. I think it's House Bill 1337. 
And then there's one that I don't recall the number of, but it's specific to, I don't remember what they call it in the bill, but under our code, it would be considered a single room occupancy. So what we'll be looking to do is to take all three of those bills and try to implement them in one opening of the code so that we're not having to come back three different times to do things that are very closely related. So that will start in July. I just actually got some background documents drafted up this week, and then um, we hope to have a draft, a he public hearing draft of the code amendments by June of 2025. Thanks, Joyce. My apologies, Councilmember Madrone. I skipped over my own note to turn it over to you after the presentation. <laughs> That's it's getting quite late. all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Joyce, just so you know, the, the term that the legislature used for SROs is co-living. Co-living. Yeah. Right. I yeah. knew it was one we didn't have in our code, but they, they also said... Well, they, they were very intentional on like trying to use language that was more accessible to the average person. You start talking about SROs and people are thinking about school resource officers and then everybody's lost. Um, but I, I just wanted to talk about um, you know the conversation that we had in the land use committee um, um, around this. Um, uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to see a lot more of Joyce these days between the comp plan update, and middle housing, and all, all sorts of other stuff. Um, and I also, I also learned that harmonize is actually a legal term. At first, I thought we were just using very flowery language, um, but it is, it's actually uh, what, what, what they call it, what the lawyers call, call it. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the things that we talked about in the Land Use Committee is that, yes, we have some things that are required of us uh, from the legislature. Um, uh, a, a, after we after we complete this step this evening of harmonizing, um, you know, we're going to be looking at you know the new requirements of us. Um, and we talked about you know what are the other things that we should maybe be considering while we're opening up our code that maybe that we maybe we want to go over and above uh, once again as we tend to do in Olympia. You know what is uh, the new requirements from the law, um, and we also were reflecting on. Um, some of the affordable housing providers that came and uh, had uh, uh, provided public comment recently on some of the challenges that uh, they were facing in building. Um, and um, we've also had some interest from other uh, land use committee members around engaging small developers in terms of, you know, how do, yes, yes, we can, you know, change our, our, our codes um, uh, for what's required of us, but there might be some other things that we can do at this point in the process uh, mm -hmm. to make it easier to build these types of uh, housing units that Olympia apparently has been working on for years and will probably work on for more years. Um, <laughs> so uh, that, that, that's the conversation that we had. Um, we've invited Joyce to come back and talk with us again in August about the, how this process is going to shape up for phase two um, and so that uh, land use can get, uh, can, can get in there early and talk about like, you know, what is it over and above that we might want to incorporate uh, into this work. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to report on the on the on the conversation that we had in committee, um, which uh, was le less about the harmonization stuff because it's pretty straightforward. Our staff have made it very easy for us by picking the best of both worlds out of the uh, the existing and the you know um, the uh, the uh, ordinance that was uh, that that we prevailed on in court. Um, and most of our conversation was about what's next, what's what's phase two look like. Thank you, Councilmember Madrone. Any questions or comments for Councilmember Madrone or Joyce? Councilmember Vanderpool. Yeah, you know, it, I, I am kind of that person who, when we're in land use, I'm like, what else can we do? You know, we just, you know, we're at this point. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with the recommendations at this stage. And then from there, we'll have the next stage later this year. Um, I am a fan of uh, the idea of a stage three, but that's just me. <laughs> give me, give me time. <laughs> yeah, let, let Joyce get a breath. My gosh. <laughs> you can't leave. You have to stay here. <laughs> thank you. I, thank you. Thank you. Much. Can I make one more comment, please? Oh, yes. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say huge shout out to Leonard Bauer, who did a huge mm -hmm. part of developing this ordinance language mm -hmm. prior to his uh, retirement. And I was on my vacation for a month. And he was working his last month, and so I came back, and he had just retired, and he made it seamless for me to bring this forward this evening. So I want to thank Leonard, even though he's no longer with the city, for his work on that. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joyce. I'm sure he's watching us at home. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure he's not. <laughs> And also special thanks to Mark Barber for a lot of counseling on getting through this. 
<laughs> All right, so at this time, I'll entertain a motion. I <laughs> Hello, okay. <laughs> Um, I move to approve the ordin an ordinance harmonizing the Olympia Municipal Code with the middle, missing middle housing ordinance uh, number 7160. Second. All those in favor of approving harmonizing the city's code with the missing middle housing ordinance signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. That was a good count, man. Mm-hmm. All right, so that takes us to our final business item for the evening, which is item 6C, uh, approval of an ordinance adopting the Capitol Mall Triangle Sub-Area Plan. Um, here to present this evening is David Ginther, uh, City Senior Planner from our Community Planning and Development Department. Ah, thank you and good evening. Hi, David. All right. Um, you have been subjected to about two, over two years of the Capitol Mall Triangle Suburb Plan. Um, so I'm very happy to bring it to you tonight in a, in a very final form. Uh, hopefully hopefully um, you'll like what you've seen. We had a study session about a month ago on this and got some good guidance from you on that. So to get into it, the sub area plan covers the area surrounding Capitol Mall. Um, basically Cooper Point, and the Black Lake Boulevard, and then about a block or two north of Harrison where it, where it divides between a lower density residential and higher density, high intensity uses. The comprehensive plan has a lot of guidance on planning for this area. Here's one of the, one of the quotes from the plan. I will read it off to you, please bear with me. Uh, the city envisions some areas such as the vicinity of Capitol Mall as areas that will gradually convert into urban neighborhoods with a mix of land use. That really encapsulates the vision for this area and this whole planning effort. Um, to get to explain it a little bit further and dive into that just a little bit more, really what we're trying to do with this project was to help implement and refine through the community's input the plan for the area. Um, the comprehensive plan also does point out that this area is a very important economic driver for the city. It's a regional draw, so continuing to support the business in the area is important. And then to facilitate and figure out why we're not getting the high density residential and to figure out ways to get that there, uh, make, it more, um, make it more welcoming for that type of development that is desired by the community. Um, where we're at in the process here is, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, Late 2021, uh, the grant was awarded. The city applied for a grant um, late in the year there, and it was awarded from Commerce, and that funded this project for the most part. Um, during the next year, we got the consultant team on board and had the existing conditions and market analysis done. Following that, late in the year and into the next into 2024, 2023 and 2024, we had the draft environmental impact statement and the draft sub area plan. Uh, so we were getting input from the public all the way through this, and that really helped shape this effort. Um, where we're at now, um, early 2024, we had the final environmental impact statement out this spring, and the final draft, i to stress that, the final draft sub-area plan was out this spring. And where we're at now is just before, uh, once this is approved, if you do approve it, um, we will we'll move into the final phase, which is the planned action ordinance, and that has the implementation actions and the development regulation changes that are recommended in this plan. With the, I mentioned uh, the community has really helped shape this project. Um, it's really driven by community input. We really made a large effort to outreach the community here. Um, some of the statistics I kept track, um, I think there is a public outreach uh, page or document in your, in your packet tonight. Um, however, if you add up, I added up everything and kept track and we had almost 30,000 emails go out to notify people of meetings uh, and events. Um, we did a very large mailing um, multiple times to make sure everybody in the vicinity, which is a lot of people live to the west of this area. There are several hundred, if not more, apartments over there. Um, so we did very large mail-outs. We utilized the e-news publication multiple times. 
and the parties of record list got very extensive when people wanted to sign up and be notified directly by email of the project. And then um, social media and the newspaper were also used. Um, <clears throat> so for community participation opportunities, we had five major community meetings. Um, we, have, we convened a stakeholder work group, which had a broad range of representation from the community. Every, 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 uh, things from the chamber all the way over to neighborhood associations and everything in between. Uh, we had three business meetings, which were focused on the business community. Uh, we notified the organizations that represent the business community to help spread the word. And so we got some great input directly from the businesses, local ones too, in the area. Um, I was invited, I was, I was fortunate to be invited to give presentations for quite a few different interest groups and clubs, um, neighborhood associations, everything from Kiwanis to the three neighborhood associations that are adjacent to this on the west side, the northwest, southwest, and then Burbank Elliott. Um, also the, the chamber, the realtors, uh, Lions Club, West Olympia Business Association. I could go on, but the, I don't think you want to hear 19 of them. Um, there were quite a few briefings for city committees um, as we went through this process. So it was uh, checking in, uh, giving a briefing on how it's going, where we're at, and what we should do in the future, giving us guidance. So that really kept us on track. And then we did do interviews with all of the major property owners and as many of the business owners as we could get, as well as some of the residents. Um, as a result of that, we did get almost 300 comments written, written comments, uh, which really helped a lot. Um, those are really the foundation for how this plan shaped up. Um, <clears throat> well, if you want to try to boil down 300 written comments, it's a little difficult, but as best we can do is this is what we came up with and the consultants really helped um, filter out and condense, boil down, however you want to put it, um, the overarching themes that we got from the public. Uh, people want to be able to move about safely and easily throughout the sub area. They would like a complete urban neighborhood with all the amenities that you expect in one. And they want to make sure that the environmental commitment the city has is upheld. Um, those are the three main ones that came out of the process. Obviously, the sub area plan is a bit more lengthy and explains a lot more of what's going on and what the direction is. But those are the three main themes that the plan revolves around. Okay, getting to the sub area plan. Uh, the recommendations, we have, I've grouped them into just a couple of categories here. There are a lot of recommendations in the plan, and there's a table at the very end that lists um, all of those. Uh, I believe it's table 9-1. Uh, I, I won't be showing that on the screen here. just wanted that for a reference for you. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I have got Kenyon Center as the first one here as a land use, and I put quotations around that because it's not um, the direction at the at the work session was say, don't make that as specific of an area. We don't want to be tied down to a small area. We'd like that to be flexible, so it can location be can be determined at a later date. Uh, basically, that would be the the focal point. It'd be a half acre public space, plaza park. Something along those lines, it would be public investment or public-private investment, and the plan talks about a number of ways to achieve that, um, as well as a people-centered people landscape. Uh, three additional um, smaller public amenities would also be, are also recommended by the plan, and location and timing um, is flexible on those. Um, those, could, those would be a smaller, <clears throat> smaller streetscape areas, many plazas, stormwater, or they could be transportation related. Uh, continuing with the land use recommendations, development regulation changes um, are the next step. And those would be addressing commercial parking regulations. And I gave an example previously of, of the mall. Um, they are right at the limit of parking spaces, so they can't take any way if they wanted to redevelop underutilized parking areas. Um, not that they said they want to do that, but they said they'd like flexibility to be able to do that in the future. And we would like to be able to provide the opportunity, especially when you see large expanses of parking areas that are not used. Uh, building heights, there are some changes to building heights, uh, slight increases in certain areas, and a bonus for affordable housing. 
um, and I've got a little bit more information on the housing in a minute, um, and some changes to the design guidelines. And these will be um, these will be studied and presented to you with the planned action ordinance following um, the adoption of this plan. And lastly, is this, the recommendation for a quarter study for Harrison. It was recognized that's a very unique area, has a lot of small local businesses in it, and it also has some transportation related challenges as well. So we felt that a study would be of that area, really focusing on that area would be good to do. And the plan has that recommendation in there. Okay, um, for the transportation slide here, I do wanna address a comment that we got earlier in the evening. Um, we received an email about 3.30 p.m. today from DOT. Um, haven't had an opportunity to respond to that one yet. Um, the question was essentially the same that I answered to DOT on June 16th. Um, and that was, um, I think she explained, I think the, uh, I think the commenter explained what their comment was. Um, the sub, I will mention that the sub area plan is a vision and policy document. So we typically don't have really specific details in there. There are exceptions. Um, however, policy and vision is mainly what sub area plans are about. Once we get to the details in the planned action ordinance, that's where things will be addressed, such as trip caps and so on. Um, if you have further questions on that specific sec, uh, subject, I do have senior planner Michelle Swanson from our transportation department here. Um, so she is here to answer any questions we, if you want to delve deeper into trip caps and those issues. Um, okay. The transportation recommendations, um, there's a whole chapter on this, um, basically in hand, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll just go down the list here very quickly for you. I know it's getting late this evening. Uh, enhanced crosswalks, low stress bike network, transit coordination, roundabouts, corridor studies, uh, new street connections, a plan for that. There is a map in here that shows the major essential street connections and then adjustments to the block sizes that are more flexible and more appropriate for the situation when, of, a, of a particular development as well as more people sized, uh, neighborhood sized. Um, I mentioned transit coordination <clears throat> just a second ago. Um, we had inner city transit on our stakeholder work group, so we worked closely with them. They were not quite ready to do, um, do specific planning for the area. They'd like to, they've, they've wanted to for quite some time, and it looks like they're getting close to that. So. Most of the plan in here says to support their planning, work with them in the future when they are ready to do that. And that would be great um, if that comes soon, right on the heels of that, that would be very good timing. Um, so Harrison Corridor Study, that's one of them. Um, and then Transit Hub, which is uh, right at the mall right now. Um, they'd like to do some planning for that. There have been some, some issues with the location and timing of routes and those kind of things. Um, it is great that a hub goes right or a service goes right to the mall, but the hub is, has got some, there's some ways to improve things there and we'd like to work with inner city transit on that. Um, some of the other things were the frequency and hours of operation, but that's something that uh, IT will need, to, inner city transit will need to work out. Okay, on the affordable housing, we heard a lot from the community that affordable housing is very important to them. That's not a surprise to any of you or, or us. Um, so we do have a section in the plan that specifically gives an affordable a height bonus to buildings that are affordable. Um, it's the building height incentive overlay. Um, there is a map in the plan for that. Um, let's see. I will reference that for you very quickly. Um, just just so everybody knows which site. Land use 8, LU8 on page 40 of the plan is the affordable height. Affordable housing height bonus. I just wanted to reference that if anybody anybody uh, wanted to look that up. Um, the plan also recommends analysis of existing city city owned properties, partnering with affordable housing developers, which the city does. Um, city does a lot of these already, um, and then strategic land per, per purchases. If the city does identify a property that would be ideal for an affordable housing project. 
Uh, buying sooner rather than later seems to be a, a little bit cheaper. As time goes on, things don't get, don't get less expensive in regards to real estates. Okay. Um, the affordable housing height incentive, there was some discussion at the council study session last month. Um, basically what that height incentive does, or the height incentive overlay, um, it's in the core of the sub area. It changes the maximum height in the high density corridor four zone from 105 feet to 130 feet. So it gives it a couple extra floors there. Um, and 100% of the way the plan is written right now, the recommendation says 100% of the units must be affordable for those making 80% or less of the area median income. Uh, that's the way it is written in the plan now, and I think there might be some discussion on that. Okay, um, okay the economic development section. Um, I did not put economic development districts on this list, but I did want to mention those. Uh, the plan does discuss those and recommends exploring those. Um, however, through further research and discussion on these, it looks like economic development districts um, tend to be more of a regional nature and may not be as applicable to a small to a sub area the size of the Capital Mall Triangle. So there may be some discussion on that as well. Um, tax increment financing is recommended by the plan. Exploring that, figuring out if that would be beneficial uh, as a way to fund some of the projects. Uh, again, the quarter planning for Harrison comes up because uh, the small businesses there and the local businesses could benefit from a, a quarter plan. It's like a much smaller uh, sub-area plan. And then uh, building and facade improvement program that, that has been successful in other areas worth exploring. Um, the city does support cooperative businesses um, and has been doing that for quite some time. And then ground floor commercial financing is another one to explore. So there are several economic development rec recommendations in this plan. Uh, I did want to mention tax increment financing in a little bit more detail. Now, there is a lot of technical um, aspects to tax increment financing. It's very new in this state. It wasn't allowed previously. Um, as a rough summary of it, um, it is an interesting way to get uh, public infrastructure built that will that will catalyze private development. Um, es essentially, I, I, would, I studied the MRC website and then looked at the treasure, this Washington State Treasurer's website as well as uh, the state code to try to come up with this very brief boiled down summary for you. There are a lot of resources out there for it. Um, basically, the property tax portion of increases in assessed value of properties within the increment area, that is used to go towards paying for the public improvement and the public infrastructure. Um, the sub area plan doesn't say you have to do it. It says, it says to explore uh, that funding source. Um, excuse me, it says to study tax increment financing. That's the exact word there. Um, that's in uh, two sections in the plan. Uh, seek funding opportunities through TIF and study, the, study tax increment financing. I said TIF, I meant tax increment financing. Some of the things that that could pay for um, are public infrastructure such as streets and sidewalks, um, the utilities such as water, sewer, and stormwater systems, even transit facilities, which we, that would be very interesting exploring that with inner city transit. Um, and then parks, rec parks and recreation facilities, and also affordable housing. Now keep in mind, these do need to be shown to actually catalyze private development in the area. Uh, and there is an analysis that's needed and it's reviewed by the Washington State Treasurer. Um, so there is a lot of analysis done ahead of time to make sure it, it looks like it will work. Um, I'm right at the end of the presentation for you and realizing it's a late night, a couple of recommended motions for you. I think you have some discussion items uh, as well. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Mayor Payne. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, before we get into questions and comments from council members, I'll turn it over to council member Madrum for comments. Yeah, and I won't, um, <clears throat> I won't repeat everything I said at the study session about this uh, very lengthy process, uh, very involved <laughs> process. Um, but I did want to pull up some of the, kind of like the hanging threads from our study session. Um, 
Well, first I want to thank Michelle Swanson because she sent me a really informative email on, you know, even though I don't see the words access management in the plan specifically, it actually is included through um, the Harrison Corridor Study that's needed, Black Lake Corridor Study, and it turns out that Cooper Point, um, which I'm actually not on as often, is designed differently, um, and it's not as much of a challenge in that side. So I thank you for that additional information. Um, some of the hanging threads that we had was, um, you know, as David suggested, the um, the affordable housing height bonus was one. Um, and um, I've uh, sat down with the chair and vice chair of the planning commission who had some concerns about that. And then Mayor Payne also, you know, expressed concerns at the study session and um, in some conversations, um, I think we'd like to recommend um, that for the, to get the affordable height bonus, uh, that only 30% of the units are required to be affordable. Uh, now more can be if the developer chooses, but that way we're not precluding mixed mm -hmm. income development with that particular incentive. Um, so that's one recommendation that um, we'd like to make for amending the plan. Um, uh, there is also the economic development district that uh, David mentioned um, is likely not the right tool to be using here. Um, so I'm going to recommend that we amend the plan to remove ED2, which is the goal that references an, EDT, an EDD, and then also just remove references from it uh, uh, throughout the plan to an EDD. Um, and then finally, with the tax increment financing, we had some discussion on that at the uh, study session as well. And I got a chance to check in with um, uh, Mike Reed in advance of this, this meeting right here. Um, and I'm actually going to recommend that we just go ahead and remove LU11, uh, which is the, um, the strategy around um, um, uh, study and potentially establish a tax, tax increment area. Um, there's other language in this um, in this uh, this strategy um, that suggests that it is best positioned to generate funds, um, but I don't think that we entirely know that. Um, I think that there's a variety of tools that can be studied, and so I, I do recommend we remove LU11 um, and references to um, tax increment financing, um, and instead in LU12, which is about focusing on catalyst sites, uh, towards the end it says, seek funding opportunities such as through a TIF or uh, the Economic Development District. I think we, we could just say seek funding opportunities including an in-depth assessment of available economic development tools. Um, and that doesn't guide future staff towards, you know, uh, one, one thing that is identified as the best potential yeah. option, but so. kind of leaves the door open. Um, uh, who knows, by the time we get here, there might be new tools uh, to look at. Uh, and there, but, but whatever we do, we are going to want to do an in-depth analysis of it so that, um, so that we're certain that it's the right thing for uh, this area, the right thing for Olympia. Um, and so that, that, those are my, my recommendations. I know, I know David had said it was the final, final plan, but yes, we do, we do still have a couple of changes where <laughs> we'll talk about this evening. So, um, so those are the loose threads that I heard at the study session and just some ideas on how to move forward on those. Thank you, Council Member Madron. Any questions or comments for Council Member Madron? Council Member Cooper. Well, my questions and comments aren't for Council or for Member Madron, they're more general, yeah. so that's okay. Yeah. Good. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so I have a one particular question and then I'll respond to what uh, Councilmember Madrone laid out. Um, can you just describe the DOT's, Department of Transportation's relationship to this plan? Are they commenting to us as a commenter or as a regulator? I might um, call up our expert on transportation, um, Michelle Swanson, senior planner. That's something you feel not really? Okay. Um, before she gets up here, I do want to mention, DOT did comment on the scoping for the environmental yeah. impact statement. Um, and we did work, we did meet with them and converse with them on multiple occasions throughout the process. And the paragraph that, that was mentioned um, tonight, uh, that is in the sub area plan that, showed, that talks about the trip cap, that was specifically added based on their comments. Um, and it sounds like they want to modify that a little bit more. Um, however, we have some concerns with modifying it even more and making it more specific when it's in the sub area plan. Uh, once we get to the planned action ordinance, that's where all the details will come in. Um, in regards to a regulator, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what you're looking for there. Is there teeth to that request? Um, 
because it sure felt that way in the way it was presented to us in public comment this evening. And I'm, I don't see that we have the Department of Transportation as a regulator to, this, to the city of Olympia. And that's the way that comment felt. And maybe I'm off base, but maybe it was the, the way it was delivered and, and, the, and the interruptions, but. Yeah, I, I would characterize it as a comment, not in their role as a regulator, especially when it comes to a planning document like this. As David mentioned, as we get into implementation of the strategies implemented here, they're certainly going to have opportunities for more input and conversation with DOT. I mean, I think they're, they're, they just, I think, really want to make sure we're looking at impacts to 101 as we look at further development in this area. That's noted. I think that the language that we have in there around trip caps speaks to their concerns. And I think that we're, uh, from a staff perspective, um, really good with the language that we have in there now. We think it does get at their concerns. But again, there'll be more opportunities in the future to have conversations with DOTs. But I see it as a comment, not as a role as a regulator. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. I, that makes me comfortable with, with the way it's presented to us. Um, and then to what Councilmember Madrone laid out, I, I don't have any problem with the suggestions you made though I was inclined to leave explore those things in the plan because I don't think we know enough to take out tax increment financing, for instance. Um, but I also think that the Economic Development District uppercase was a mistake. And it should have talked about local improvement, which are also Economic Development District lowercase. And so I would just like to go and make all of those letters lowercase and keep the opportunity to explore economic development types of districts within that plan. And I don't have the ability to search in my PDF in my Safari app, so I couldn't go and look if there was already a wood section I had forgotten about. So I'm, I'm happy to go with the, with the group on that one, but otherwise I, I'm pretty supportive generally. Council Member Madrone followed by Council Member Vanderpool. Yeah, just to respond to that real quick, I did check in with Mike Reed in terms of like the language here, and he felt that with what I suggested in terms of a change, uh, that that would give him the flexibility to explore any tools that are available, um, you know, and um, and like I said, we would want to do an in-depth analysis and know what exact what, what is the right thing for us to be doing. Council Member Vanderpool followed by Council Member Parsh. Well, I just, I was just before, I was hoping that um, Council Member Madrone could just repeat her recommendation under oh, LU11, I think, the TIF, instead of sure. using that language. What was the language you were recommending? I just don't remember. Sure. Yeah, um, I recommended removing LU11 and then for LU12, which is the, the strategy on focusing on catalyst sites, um, the last sentence currently says seek funding opportunities such as through tax increment financing or an economic development district. Um, and I'm recommending seek funding opportunities, including an in-depth assessment of available economic development tools. That's everything, okay, thank you. Thank you. It's too fast. Yeah. I didn't get it. Um, I, I, I agree with this, those changes also. Um, but I, I have a, a bit of a question regarding the plan to action ordinance. So, um, this going forward, and we're going to have uh, several studies coming after regarding transportation, but I'm also curious about, um, is, in the planned action ordinance, are we going to have some sort of measure to say we have to come back to this? Because I really don't want us to do this, and then it turns out some of, some of the things that were an oversight that we have to make adjustments in the future regarding land use or transportation or, so for example, the way it is now, although we allow for certain levels of density, the parking became a barrier that became apparent to us over time. Is there anything in there that's gonna require us to go back and just make needed adjustments after this is passed? Well, with, with a lot of sub area planning, long range planning, you often do have to do, I, I guess you could almost call it maintenance mm -hmm. um, as you go along. Um, certain things happen you may not anticipate, which is what you're getting at. And sometimes you do have to make adjustments. Um, so we, it's, it's really um, rare that you can get it perfect the first time. Yeah. And sometimes I've heard planning called the art of muddling through. Uh -huh. um, so, mm -hmm. There you go. So. Cool. Yeah. Yes, and future councils also might have different ideas. Uh, council member Parsley. 
This is more of a comment, um, and it's sort of based on when we heard TRPC come in and talk about our housing needs and our housing assessment and the biggest gap that they foresee in Olympia being actually workforce, which is about 125 to 80% AMI. I guess I've, I've, I'm, if we're going to be building like the Planning Commission's letter kind of insinuated towards making sure that we're not um, causing affordable housing to be lumped together and, and try to do inclusionary by accident. Um, I'm also wondering if affordable could be less than 100% AMI because there's a large workforce group in that extra 20% that we would hit based on the TRPC housing needs, which is we're not building in that area. Council Member Gilman, followed by Council Member Vanderpool. Thank you. I, I just wanted to agree with Council Member Parshley that okay. um, I was struck by both the Planning Commission and the Social Justice and, and um, Equity Commission's concerns around mm -hmm. incentivizing um, low income housing in, in a particular geographic part of the, the zone. Um, and I I wonder, since we're making amendments that you just mentioned the words inclusionary zoning, um, I wonder about mandating units within the building and not allowing fee and lieu for the MFT in here. I, I, I just, um, my hope is that this would be an opportunity um, to plan for a showcase rather than sort of a smokestack chasing, um, like your words, David, we're make it more welcoming for high density development. We can make it more welcoming, but can't we simultaneously be advocating for the kind of community that we want to have? So, so I, and I, I know it's it's a little bit messy opening it up and editing it here at the end of a two-year process, but but I, I would feel strongly that that we need to include specific community benefit and also assess the cost of additional incentives like the tax increment financing. Um, what, you know, what, are, what are we not getting somewhere else in the city if we're allowing taxes from the building to go to, uh, to the, the adjacent improvements? So I, you know, I, just, I, I think there's an opportunity here if we wanna talk about genuinely encouraging mixed income that we would um, want to have policy planks that insist on uh, buildings having a mix of incomes. So. Council Member Vanderpool. Um, this may be a kind of a legal question around this. So if we're gonna give uh, height bonuses and give certain benefits, um, uh, free lunch essentially to a developer, uh, could it be, could, is it legal to do uh, a covenant that requires mixed income on on a development on a parcel of land. If we're going to allow certain benefits of development, and if so, could we add that as a amendment? I don't know if the, if you can answer that. Being that it's a legal question, I I no. would defer. City attorney. I try to avoid giving legal advice publicly <laughs> because it effectively waives the attorney-client privilege. However, I think I understand the Council Member Vanderpool's question, and I will make a note and I will communicate that legal advice in a confidential attorney-client privileged email. If I'm that's acceptable. I'm getting good at this. I knew that was going to be your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Council Member Madrone. Um, I can I can speak to it a little bit um, like you know it's a bit out of my area of expertise but I did talk with uh, Darian Lightfoot about you know changing this uh, for the affordable housing height bonus changing it from 100% to 30% um, and she said that the actually the best way to make that happen is to um, when a, when a building is built with that height bonus to put a covenant on the the building that requires that 30% of the units are um, affordable units. So if your question is that we require certain incomes at certain levels through a covenant, um, 
uh, I think it's entirely too messy to get into this evening. Um, and just in response to what Councilmember Gilman is talking about with um, inclusionary zoning, um, it's unfortunate to have that big of a change come up this late in the process. It's a it's a very complicated topic, um, and you know I welcome having that discussion in land use more broadly. Yeah. Um, but I it's uh, I I I can't support opening up such a big uh, pivot. Um, at this eleventh hour in this in this uh, planning process, um, yeah. City Manager Bernie, thank you. Not to assert my friend the city attorney, and, he, and I'll let him give his advice. I think I just wanted to echo comments by Councilmember Madrone. I think when it comes to covenants, it's easier to to write covenants around percentage of units that you want at certain AMIs than it is to write something around income levels. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other thing with that is AMI might be a better tool because incomes are relative to yeah. moments in time mm -hmm. where $50,000 at one moment in time could be affordable and at another yeah. moment in time it may not be. So um, I think there's a lot that goes into that conversation, but I would just echo that it might be easier to kind of talk about covenants around AMI and percentage of units than around incomes. But okay. cool. Yeah, um, I'll pull back that. That, that thought for uh, further discussion in the future regarding citywide motions. Okay, so I'm hearing a lot of proposed changes. Um, and so I, I'm wondering if we um, maybe need to push the pause button on this. And redraft. I am redraft it. Redraft it and bring it back for adoption. Council Member Madrone. Well, another another option is to get specific about the amendments uh, through a motion, um, and then we will see it at second reading. Um, that 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 is also an option. So we do get one more look at the complete document before we do our second vote on it. So that's that's an, a possibility as well. Fair can enough. I, Thank can you. I, can I add on to that, Council Member Cooper? Yes, and that, that specificity does not need to be wordsmithing. It can be conceptual, and then David and the team can do the wordsmithing in the second draft that they bring in. Yep. Okay. Yes. Everyone good with that? Okay. Thumbs up? All right. Well, uh, is there any further discussion before we move? All right. Seeing none, uh, Council Member Madrone, I'd like to... Or excuse me, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> Council Member you Vanderpool. Uh, would you like to okay. make the motion? Yeah. <laughs> I will. I I will motion to approve the ordinance of adopting the Capital City Triangle Sub Area Plan as amended and discussed. I need a second. I I'll, I'll second. But do we want to specifically state yes. what the amendments are so that we're all clear? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, changing the affordable housing density bonus from 100% to 30% affordable housing units, uh, removing ED2 and LU11, um, and all references to tax increment financing and economic development districts, and modifying LU12 for the final sentence to say, seek funding opportunities, including an in-depth analysis of available economic development tools. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of adopting the Capital Mall Triangle Subarea Plan as um, discussed or, or as amended, amended as discussed, <laughs> signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion passes 6 1. All right, so that concludes our business for this evening. Uh, thank you very much, David, um, for the presentation and for your work. Um, and we look forward to you coming back uh, with those proposed changes um, for a second reading. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, we are going to forego uh, council reports this evening. I think we're getting acclimated um, after our break and being here for quite an extensive amount of time so uh but we will certainly do those reports next week so um uh, it looks like our city manager may have something so i will turn it over to the city manager
I just, it's, it's a good news thing. I just want to highlight two events on Saturday. Good. So, oh. so okay. one is the fire department and the Hands On Children's yeah. Museum are hosting the <laughs> fire rescue spectacular yes. uh, from 10 to a.m. to 3 p.m. on Saturday the 13th. And then later in the day, we'll be unveiling the Percival Plinth sculptures for the year with a celebration event um, from 5 to 7 p.m. down on Percival Landing. So I just wanted to highlight those two events this yeah. weekend if you're looking for something to do in the sunshine. Yeah. Perfect. Did that for me, so now I don't have to. With no further business before the Olympia City Council, we're adjourned. Good night. Call it a night.